At the Moon and Sixpence Chapter 1, I confess that when first I made acquaintance with Charles Strickland, I never for a moment discerned that there was in him anything out of the ordinary. Yet now few will be found to deny his greatness. I do not speak of that greatness which is achieved by the fortunate politician or the successful soldier. That is a quality which belongs to the place he occupies rather than to the man, and a change of circumstances reduces it to very discreet proportions. The Prime Minister out of office is seen, too often, to have been but a pompous rhetorician, and the general without an army is but the tame hero of a market town. The greatness of Charles Strickland was authentic. It may be that you do not like his art, but at all events you can hardly refuse it the tribute of your interest. He disturbs and arrests. The time has passed when he was an object of ridicule, and it is no longer a mark of eccentricity to defend or of perversity to extol him. His faults are accepted as the necessary complement to his merits. It is still possible to discuss his place in art. And the adulation of his admirers is perhaps no less capricious than the disparagement of his detractors, but one thing can never be doubtful and that is that he had genius. To my mind the most interesting thing in art is the personality of the artist, and if that is singular, I am willing to excuse a thousand faults. I suppose Velasquez was a better painter than El Greco, but custom stales one's admiration for him, the Cretan, sensual and tragic proffers the mystery of his soul like a standing sacrifice. The artist, painter, poet, or musician, by his decoration, sublime or beautiful, satisfies the aesthetic sense. But that is akin to the sexual instinct, and shares its barbarity, he lays before you also the greater gift of himself. To pursue his secret has something of the fascination of a detective story. It is a riddle which shares with the universe the merit of having no answer. The most insignificant of Strickland's works suggests a personality which is strange, tormented, and complex. And it is this surely which prevents even those who do not like his pictures from being indifferent to them. It is this which has excited so curious an interest in his life and character. It was not till four years after Strickland's death that Maurice Hurrett wrote that article in the underscore. Mercure de France underscore which rescued the unknown painter from oblivion and blazed the trail which succeeding writers, with more or less docility, have followed. For a long time no critic has enjoyed in France a more incontestable authority, and it was impossible not to be impressed by the claims he made, they seemed extravagant. But later judgments have confirmed his estimate, and the reputation of Charles Strickland is now firmly established on the lines which he laid down. The rise of this reputation is one of the most romantic incidents in the history of art. But I do not propose to deal with Charles Strickland's work except in so far as it touches upon his character. I cannot agree with the painters who claim superciliously that the layman can understand nothing of painting and that he can best show his appreciation of their works by silence and a checkbook. It is a grotesque misapprehension which sees in art no more than a craft comprehensible perfectly only to the craftsman. Art is a manifestation of emotion. And emotion speaks a language that all may understand. But I will allow that the critic who has not a practical knowledge of technique is seldom able to say anything on the subject of real value, 
and my ignorance of painting is extreme. Fortunately, there is no need for me to risk the adventure, since my friend, Mr. Edward Leggett, an able writer as well as an admirable painter, has exhaustively discussed Charles Strickland's work in a little book, one, which is a charming example of a style, for the most part, less happily cultivated in England than in France. 1. A Modern Artist Notes on the Work of Charles Strickland by Edward Leggett, A.R.H.A. Martin Secker, 1917 Maurice Hurrett, in his famous article, gave an outline of Charles Strickland's life, which was well calculated to whet the appetites of the inquiring. With his disinterested passion for art, he had a real desire to call the attention of the wise to a talent which was in the highest degree original. But he was too good a journalist to be unaware that the human interest would enable him more easily to effect his purpose. And when such as had come in contact with Strickland in the past, writers who had known him in London, painters who had met him in the cafés of Montmartre, discovered to their amazement that where they had seen but an unsuccessful artist, like another. Authentic genius had rubbed shoulders with them there began to appear in the magazines of France and America a succession of articles, the reminiscences of one. The appreciation of another, which added to Strickland's notoriety, and fed without satisfying the curiosity of the public. The subject was grateful, and the industrious Whitebreck Trotholes in his imposing monograph, too, has been able to give a remarkable list of authorities, too, Carl Strickland, Saint Laban und Saint Kunst, by Hugo Whitebreck Trotholes, Ph.D. Schwingel und Hanisch, Leipzig, 1914. The faculty for myth is innate in the human race. It seizes with avidity upon any incidents, surprising or mysterious. In the career of those who have at all distinguished themselves from their fellows, and invents a legend to which it then attaches a fanatical belief. It is the protest of romance against the commonplace of life. The incidents of the legend become the hero's surest passport to immortality. The ironic philosopher reflects with a smile that Sir Walter Raleigh is more safely enshrined in the memory of mankind because he set his cloak for the Virgin Queen to walk on than because he carried the English name to undiscovered countries. Charles Strickland lived obscurely. He made enemies rather than friends. It is not strange, then, that those who wrote of him should have eked out their scanty recollections with a lively fancy. And it is evident that there was enough in the little that was known of him to give opportunity to the romantic scribe. There was much in his life which was strange and terrible. In his character something outrageous, and in his fate not a little that was pathetic. In due course a legend arose of such circumstantiality that the wise historian would hesitate to attack it. But a wise historian is precisely what the Reverend Robert Strickland is not. He wrote his biography, 3, avowedly to remove certain misconceptions which had gained currency in regard to the later part of his father's life, and which had caused considerable pain to persons still living. It is obvious that there was much in the commonly received account of Strickland's life to embarrass a respectable family. I have read this work with a good deal of amusement, and upon this I congratulate myself, since it is colorless and dull. Mr. Strickland has drawn the portrait of an excellent husband and father, 
a man of kindly temper, industrious habits, and moral disposition. The modern clergyman has acquired in his study of the science which I believe is called exegesis an astonishing facility for explaining things away. But the subtlety with which the Reverend Robert Strickland has interpreted all the facts in his father's life which a dutiful son might find it inconvenient to remember must surely lead him in the fullness of time to the highest dignities of the church. I see already his muscular calves encased in the gaiter's episcopal. It was a hazardous, though maybe a gallant thing to do. Since it is probable that the legend commonly received has had no small share in the growth of Strickland's reputation. For there are many who have been attracted to his art by the detestation in which they held his character or the compassion with which they regarded his death. And the son's well-meaning efforts threw a singular chill upon the father's admirers. It is due to no accident that when one of his most important works underscore the woman of Samaria underscore comma, four, was sold at Christie's shortly after the discussion which followed the publication of Mr. Strickland's biography. It fetched £235 less than it had done nine months before when it was bought by the distinguished collector whose sudden death had brought it once more under the hammer. Perhaps Charles Strickland's power and originality would scarcely have sufficed to turn the scale if the remarkable mythopoeic faculty of mankind had not brushed aside with impatience a story which disappointed all its craving for the extraordinary. And presently Dr. Whitebreck Trotholes produced the work which finally set at rest the misgivings of all lovers of art. 3. Strickland the Man and His Work, by his son, Robert Strickland. W. M. Heinemann, 1913. 4. This was described in Christie's catalogue as follows, A nude woman, a native of the Society Islands, is lying on the ground beside a brook. Behind is a tropical landscape with palm trees, bananas, etc. 60 inches x 48 inches dr whitebreck trotholes belongs to that school of historians which believes that human nature is not only about as bad as it can be but a great deal worse and certainly the reader is safer of entertainment in their hands than in those of the writers who take a malicious pleasure in representing the great figures of romance as patterns of the domestic virtues. For my part, I should be sorry to think that there was nothing between Anthony and Cleopatra but an economic situation and it will require a great deal more evidence than is ever likely to be available thank God, to persuade me that Tiberius was as blameless a monarch as King George V, dr. Whitebreck Trotholes has dealt in such terms with the Reverend Robert Strickland's innocent biography that it is difficult to avoid feeling a certain sympathy for the unlucky parson. His decent reticence is branded as hypocrisy, his circumlocutions are roundly called lies, and his silence is vilified as treachery. And on the strength of peccadilloes, reprehensible in an author, but excusable in a son, the Anglo-Saxon race is accused of prudishness, humbug, pretentiousness, deceit, cunning, and bad cooking. Personally, I think it was rash of Mr. Strickland, in refuting the account which had gained belief of a certain unpleasantness between his father and mother. To state that Charles Strickland in a letter written from Paris had described her as an excellent woman, since Dr. Whitebreck Trotholes was able to print the letter in facsimile. And it appears that the passage referred to ran in fact as follows, underscore God damn my wife. 
she is an excellent woman. I wish she was in hell, underscore. It is not thus that the church in its great days dealt with evidence that was unwelcome. Dr. Whitebreck Trotholes was an enthusiastic admirer of Charles Strickland. And there was no danger that he would whitewash him. He had an unerring eye for the despicable motive in actions that had all the appearance of innocence. He was a psychopathologist, as well as a student of art, and the subconscious had few secrets from him. No mystic ever saw deeper meaning in common things. The mystic sees the ineffable, and the psychopathologist the unspeakable. There is a singular fascination in watching the eagerness with which the learned author ferrets out every circumstance which may throw discredit on his hero. His heart warms to him when he can bring forward some example of cruelty or meanness, and he exults like an inquisitor at the underscore auto de fe underscore of an heretic when with some forgotten story he can confound the filial piety of the Reverend Robert Strickland. His industry has been amazing. Nothing has been too small to escape him. And you may be sure that if Charles Strickland left a laundry bill unpaid it will be given you underscore in extenso underscore. And if he forbore to return a borrowed half-crown, no detail of the transaction will be omitted. Chapter 2 When so much has been written about Charles Strickland It may seem unnecessary that I should write more. A painter's monument is his work. It is true I knew him more intimately than most. I met him first, before ever he became a painter and I saw him not infrequently during the difficult years he spent in Paris. But I do not suppose I should ever have set down my recollections if the hazards of the war had not taken me to Tahiti. There, as is notorious, he spent the last years of his life. And there I came across persons who were familiar with him. I find myself in a position to throw light on just that part of his tragic career which has remained most obscure. If they who believe in Strickland's greatness are right, the personal narratives of such as knew him in the flesh can hardly be superfluous. What would we not give for the reminiscences of someone who had been as intimately acquainted with El Greco as I was with Strickland? But I seek refuge in no such excuses. I forget who it was that recommended men for their soul's good to do each day two things they disliked. It was a wise man, and it is a precept that I have followed scrupulously. For every day I have got up and I have gone to bed. But there is in my nature a strain of asceticism and I have subjected my flesh each week to a more severe mortification. I have never failed to read the literary supplement of underscore the times, underscore it is a salutary discipline to consider the vast number of books that are written. The fair hopes with which their authors see them published, and the fate which awaits them. What chance is there that any book will make its way among that multitude? And the successful books are but the successes of a season. Heaven knows what pains the author has been at, what bitter experiences he has endured and what heartache suffered. To give some chance reader a few hours relaxation or to while away the tedium of a journey. And if I may judge from the reviews, many of these books are well and carefully written. Much thought has gone to their composition, to some even has been given the anxious labor of a lifetime. The moral I draw is that the writer should seek his reward in the pleasure of his work and in release from the burden of his thought, 
and indifferent to aught else. Care nothing for praise or censure, failure or success. Now the war has come, bringing with it a new attitude. Youth has turned to God's we of an earlier day knew not. And it is possible to see already the direction in which those who come after us will move. The younger generation, conscious of strength and tumultuous, have done with knocking at the door, they have burst in and seated themselves in our seats. The air is noisy with their shouts. Of their elders some, by imitating the antics of youth, strive to persuade themselves that their day is not yet over. They shout with the loosest, but the war cry sounds hollow in their mouth. They are like poor wantons attempting with pencil, paint and powder, with shrill gaiety, to recover the illusion of their spring. The wiser go their way with a decent grace. In their chastened smile is an indulgent mockery. They remember that they too trod down a sated generation, with just such clamor and with just such scorn. And they foresee that these brave torchbearers will presently yield their place also. There is no last word. The new evangel was old when Nineveh reared her greatness to the sky. These gallant words, which seem so novel to those that speak them, were said in accents scarcely changed a hundred times before. The pendulum swings backwards and forwards. The circle is ever traveled anew. Sometimes a man survives a considerable time from an era in which he had his place into one which is strange to him. And then the curious are offered one of the most singular spectacles in the human comedy. Who now, for example, thinks of George Crabb? He was a famous poet in his day. And the world recognized his genius with a unanimity which the greater complexity of modern life has rendered infrequent. He had learned his craft at the school of Alexander Pope. And he wrote moral stories in rhymed couplets. Then came the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, and the poets sang new songs. Mr. Crabbe continued to write moral stories in rhymed couplets. I think he must have read the verse of these young men who were making so great a stir in the world. And I fancy he found it poor stuff. Of course, much of it was. But the odes of Keats and of Wordsworth, a poem or two by Coleridge, a few more by Shelley discovered vast realms of the spirit that none had explored before. Mr. Crabbe was as dead as mutton, but Mr. Crabbe continued to write moral stories in rhymed couplets. I have read desultorily the writings of the younger generation. It may be that among them a more fervid Keats, a more ethereal Shelley, has already published numbers the world will willingly remember. I cannot tell. I admire their polish, their youth is already so accomplished that it seems absurd to speak of promise. I marvel at the felicity of their style, but with all their copiousness, their vocabulary suggests that they fingered Roger's underscore thesaurus underscore in their cradles, they say nothing to me. To my mind they know too much and feel too obviously. I cannot stomach the hardiness with which they slap me on the back or the emotion with which they hurl themselves on my bosom. Their passion seems to me a little anemic and their dreams a trifle dull. I do not like them. I am on the shelf. I will continue to write moral stories in rhymed couplets. But I should be thrice a fool if I did it for aught but my own entertainment.
Chapter 3, But All This Is By The Way I was very young when I wrote my first book. By a lucky chance it excited attention, and various persons sought my acquaintance. It is not without melancholy that I wander among my recollections of the world of letters in London when first, bashful but eager, I was introduced to it. It is long since I frequented it. And if the novels that describe its present singularities are accurate much in it is now changed. The venue is different. Chelsea and Bloomsbury have taken the place of Hampstead, Notting Hill Gate, and High Street, Kensington. Then it was a distinction to be under 40, but now to be more than 25 is absurd. I think in those days we were a little shy of our emotions, and the fear of ridicule tempered the more obvious forms of pretentiousness. I do not believe that there was in that genteel bohemia an intensive culture of chastity, but I do not remember so crude a promiscuity as seems to be practiced in the present day. We did not think it hypocritical to draw over our vagaries the curtain of a decent silence. The spade was not invariably called a bloody shovel. Woman had not yet altogether come into her own. I lived near Victoria Station, and I recall long excursions by bus to the hospitable houses of the literary. In my timidity I wandered up and down the street while I screwed up my courage to ring the bell, and then, sick with apprehension, was ushered into an airless room full of people. I was introduced to this celebrated person after that one, and the kind words they said about my book made me excessively uncomfortable. I felt they expected me to say clever things, and I never could think of any till after the party was over. I tried to conceal my embarrassment by handing round cups of tea and rather ill-cut bread and butter. I wanted no one to take notice of me, so that I could observe these famous creatures at my ease and listen to the clever things they said. I have a recollection of large, unbending women with great noses and rapacious eyes, who wore their clothes as though they were armor, and of little, mouse-like spinsters, with soft voices and a shrewd glance. I never ceased to be fascinated by their persistence in eating buttered toast with their gloves on. And I observed with admiration the unconcern with which they wiped their fingers on their chair when they thought no one was looking. It must have been bad for the furniture. But I suppose the hostess took her revenge on the furniture of her friends when, in turn, she visited them. Some of them were dressed fashionably, and they said they couldn't for the life of them see why you should be dowdy just because you had written a novel, if you had a neat figure you might as well make the most of it. And a smart shoe on a small foot had never prevented an editor from taking your stuff. But others thought this frivolous, and they wore art fabrics and barbaric jewelry. The men were seldom eccentric in appearance. They tried to look as little like authors as possible. They wished to be taken for men of the world, and could have passed anywhere for the managing clerks of a city firm. They always seemed a little tired. I had never known writers before, and I found them very strange but I do not think they ever seemed to me quite real. I remember that I thought their conversation brilliant, and I used to listen with astonishment to the stinging humor with which they would tear a brother author to pieces the moment that his back was turned. The artist has this advantage over the rest of the world, that his friends offer not only their appearance and their character to his satire, 
but also their work. I despaired of ever expressing myself with such aptness or with such fluency. In those days conversation was still cultivated as an art. A neat repartee was more highly valued than the crackling of thorns under a pot, and the epigram, not yet a mechanical appliance by which the dull may achieve a semblance of wit, gave sprightliness to the small talk of the urbane. It is sad that I can remember nothing of all this scintillation. But I think the conversation never settled down so comfortably as when it turned to the details of the trade, which was the other side of the art we practiced. When we had done discussing the merits of the latest book, it was natural to wonder how many copies had been sold, what advance the author had received and how much he was likely to make out of it. Then we would speak of this publisher and of that, comparing the generosity of one with the meanness of another. We would argue whether it was better to go to one who gave handsome royalties or to another who pushed a book for all it was worth. Some advertised badly and some well. Some were modern and some were old-fashioned, then we would talk of agents and the offers they had obtained for us, of editors and the sort of contributions they welcomed. How much they paid a thousand, and whether they paid promptly or otherwise. To me it was all very romantic. It gave me an intimate sense of being a member of some mystic brotherhood. Chapter 4 No one was kinder to me at that time than Rose Waterford. She combined a masculine intelligence with a feminine perversity. And the novels she wrote were original and disconcerting. It was at her house one day that I met Charles Strickland's wife. Miss Waterford was giving a tea party. And her small room was more than usually full. Everyone seemed to be talking, and I, sitting in silence, felt awkward. But I was too shy to break into any of the groups that seemed absorbed in their own affairs. Miss Waterford was a good hostess, and seeing my embarrassment came up to me. I want you to talk to Mrs. Strickland, she said, she's raving about your book. What does she do? I asked. I was conscious of my ignorance, and if Mrs. Strickland was a well-known writer I thought it as well to ascertain the fact before I spoke to her. Rose Waterford cast down her eyes demurely to give greater effect to her reply. She gives luncheon parties. You've only got to roar a little, and she'll ask you. Rose Waterford was a cynic. She looked upon life as an opportunity for writing novels and the public as her raw material. Now and then she invited members of it to her house if they showed an appreciation of her talent and entertained with proper lavishness. She held their weakness for lions in good-humored contempt but played to them her part of the distinguished woman of letters with decorum. I was led up to Mrs. Strickland, and for ten minutes we talked together. I noticed nothing about her except that she had a pleasant voice. She had a flat in Westminster, overlooking the unfinished cathedral. And because we lived in the same neighborhood, we felt friendly disposed to one another. The Army and Navy stores are a bond of union between all who dwell between the river and stay. James's Park Mrs. Strickland asked me for my address, and a few days later I received an invitation to luncheon. My engagements were few, and I was glad to accept. When I arrived, a little late, because in my fear of being too early I had walked three times round the cathedral, 
I found the party already complete. Miss Waterford was there and Mrs. J. Richard Twining and George Rode. We were all writers. It was a fine day, early in spring, and we were in a good humor. We talked about a hundred things. Miss Waterford. Torn between the aestheticism of her early youth, when she used to go to parties in sage green, holding a daffodil, and the flippancy of her mature years, which tended to high heels and Paris frocks, wore a new hat. It put her in high spirits. I had never heard her more malicious about our common friends. Mrs. J. Aware that impropriety is the soul of wit, made observations in tones hardly above a whisper that might well have tinged the snowy tablecloth with a rosy hue. Richard Twining bubbled over with quaint absurdities, and George Rode, conscious that he need not exhibit a brilliancy which was almost a byword, opened his mouth only to put food into it. Mrs. Strickland did not talk much, but she had a pleasant gift for keeping the conversation general. And when there was a pause she threw in just the right remark to set it going once more. She was a woman of thirty-seven, rather tall and plump, without being fat, she was not pretty. But her face was pleasing, chiefly, perhaps, on account of her kind brown eyes. Her skin was rather sallow. Her dark hair was elaborately dressed. She was the only woman of the three whose face was free of makeup, and by contrast with the others she seemed simple and unaffected. The dining room was in the good taste of the period. It was very severe. There was a high dado of white wood and a green paper on which were etchings by Whistler in neat black frames. The green curtains with their peacock design hung in straight lines, and the green carpet, in the pattern of which pale rabbits frolicked among leafy trees, suggested the influence of William Morris. There was blue delft on the chimney piece. At that time there must have been 500 dining rooms in London decorated in exactly the same manner. It was chaste, artistic, and dull. When we left I walked away with Miss Waterford, and the fine day and her new hat persuaded us to saunter through the park. That was a very nice party, I said, did you think the food was good? I told her that if she wanted riders she must feed them well. Admirable advice, I answered, but why does she want them? Miss Waterford shrugged her shoulders, she finds them amusing. She wants to be in the movement. I fancy she's rather simple, poor dear, and she thinks we're all wonderful. After all, it pleases her to ask us to luncheon, and it doesn't hurt us. I like her for it. Looking back, I think that misses. Strickland was the most harmless of all the lion hunters that pursue their quarry from the rarefied heights of Hampstead to the nethermost studios of Shane Walk. She had led a very quiet youth in the country, and the books that came down from Moody's library brought with them not only their own romance, but the romance of London. She had a real passion for reading, rare in her kind, who for the most part are more interested in the author than in his book, in the painter than in his pictures. And she invented a world of the imagination in which she lived with a freedom she never acquired in the world of every day. When she came to know writers it was like adventuring upon a stage which till then she had known only from the other side of the footlights. She saw them dramatically and really seemed herself to live a larger life 
because she entertained them and visited them in their fastnesses. She accepted the rules with which they played the game of life as valid for them, but never for a moment thought of regulating her own conduct in accordance with them. Their moral eccentricities, like their oddities of dress, their wild theories and paradoxes, were an entertainment which amused her, but had not the slightest influence on her convictions. Is there a Mr. Strickland? I asked, oh yes, he's something in the city. I believe he's a stockbroker. He's very dull. Are they good friends? They adore one another. You'll meet him if you dine there. But she doesn't often have people to dinner. He's very quiet. He's not in the least interested in literature or the arts. Why do nice women marry dull men? Because intelligent men won't marry nice women. I could not think of any retort to this, so I asked if Mrs. Strickland had children, yes. She has a boy and a girl. They're both at school. The subject was exhausted, and we began to talk of other things. Chapter 5 During the summer I met Mrs. Strickland not infrequently. I went now and then to pleasant little luncheons at her flat, and to rather more formidable tea parties. We took a fancy to one another. I was very young, and perhaps she liked the idea of guiding my virgin steps on the hard road of letters, while for me it was pleasant to have someone I could go to with my small troubles. Certain of an attentive ear and reasonable counsel. Mrs. Strickland had the gift of sympathy. It is a charming faculty, but one often abused by those who are conscious of its possession. For there is something ghoulish in the avidity with which they will pounce upon the misfortune of their friends so that they may exercise their dexterity. It gushes forth like an oil well, and the sympathetic pour out their sympathy with an abandon that is sometimes embarrassing to their victims. There are bosoms on which so many tears have been shed that I cannot bedew them with mine. Mrs. Strickland used her advantage with tact. You felt that you obliged her by accepting her sympathy. When, in the enthusiasm of my youth, I remarked on this to Rose Waterford, she said, Milk is very nice, especially with a drop of brandy in it but the domestic cow is only too glad to be rid of it. A swollen udder is very uncomfortable. Rose Waterford had a blistering tongue. No one could say such bitter things. On the other hand, no one could do more charming ones. There was another thing I liked in Mrs. Strickland. She managed her surroundings with elegance. Her flat was always neat and cheerful, gay with flowers, and the chintzes in the drawing room, notwithstanding their severe design, were bright and pretty. The meals in the artistic little dining room were pleasant, the table looked nice, the two maids were trim and comely, the food was well cooked. It was impossible not to see that Mrs. Strickland was an excellent housekeeper, and you felt sure that she was an admirable mother. There were photographs in the drawing room of her son and daughter. The son, his name was Robert, was a boy of 16 at rugby, and you saw him in flannels and a cricket cap, and again in a tailcoat and a stand-up collar. He had his mother's candid brow and fine, reflective eyes. He looked clean, healthy, and normal. I don't know that he's very clever, she said one day, when I was looking at the photograph, but I know he's good. He has a charming character. 
The daughter was 14. Her hair, thick and dark like her mother's, fell over her shoulders in fine profusion, and she had the same kindly expression and sedate, untroubled eyes. They're both of them the image of you, I said, yes, I think they are more like me than their father. Why have you never let me meet him? I asked, would you like to? She smiled. Her smile was really very sweet, and she blushed a little. It was singular that a woman of that age should flush so readily. Perhaps her naivete was her greatest charm, you know. He's not at all literary, she said, he's a perfect Philistine. She said this not disparagingly, but affectionately rather, as though, by acknowledging the worst about him. She wished to protect him from the aspersions of her friends, he's on the stock exchange, and he's a typical broker. I think he'd bore you to death. Does he bore you? I asked, you see. I happen to be his wife. I'm very fond of him. She smiled to cover her shyness. And I fancied she had a fear that I would make the sort of jibe that such a confession could hardly have failed to elicit from Rose Waterford. She hesitated a little. Her eyes grew tender. He doesn't pretend to be a genius. He doesn't even make much money on the stock exchange. But he's awfully good and kind. I think I should like him very much. I'll ask you to dine with us quietly sometime, but mind, you come at your own risk. Don't blame me if you have a very dull evening. Chapter 6 But when at last I met Charles Strickland, it was under circumstances which allowed me to do no more than just make his acquaintance. One morning Mrs. Strickland sent me round a note to say that she was giving a dinner party that evening, and one of her guests had failed her. She asked me to stop the gap. She wrote, It's only decent to warn you that you will be bored to extinction. It was a thoroughly dull party from the beginning, but if you will come I shall be uncommonly grateful. And you and I can have a little chat by ourselves. It was only neighborly to accept. When Mrs. Strickland introduced me to her husband, he gave me a rather indifferent hand to shake. Turning to him gaily, she attempted a small jest, I asked him to show him that I really had a husband. I think he was beginning to doubt it. Strickland gave the polite little laugh with which people acknowledge a facetiousness in which they see nothing funny, but did not speak. New arrivals claimed my host's attention, and I was left to myself. When at last we were all assembled, waiting for dinner to be announced, I reflected, while I chatted with the woman I had been asked to take in. That civilized man practices a strange ingenuity in wasting on tedious exercises the brief span of his life. It was the kind of party which makes you wonder why the hostess has troubled to bid her guests, and why the guests have troubled to come. There were ten people. They met with indifference, and would part with relief. It was, of course, a purely social function. The Stricklands owed dinners to a number of persons, whom they took no interest in, and so had asked them. These persons had accepted. Why? To avoid the tedium of dining underscore tete a tete underscore, to give their servants a rest, because there was no reason to refuse, because they were owed a dinner. The dining room was inconveniently crowded. There was a KC and his wife, 
a government official and his wife, Mrs. Strickland's sister and her husband, Colonel McAndrew, and the wife of a member of parliament. It was because the member of parliament found that he could not leave the house that I had been invited. The respectability of the party was portentous. The women were too nice to be well-dressed, and too sure of their position to be amusing. The men were solid. There was about all of them an air of well-satisfied prosperity. Everyone talked a little louder than natural in an instinctive desire to make the party go. And there was a great deal of noise in the room. But there was no general conversation. Each one talked to his neighbor, to his neighbor on the right during the soup, fish, and entree. To his neighbor on the left during the roast, sweet, and savory. They talked of the political situation and of golf, of their children and the latest play. Of the pictures at the Royal Academy, of the weather and their plans for the holidays. There was never a pause, and the noise grew louder. Mrs. Strickland might congratulate herself that her party was a success. Her husband played his part with decorum. Perhaps he did not talk very much. And I fancied there was towards the end a look of fatigue in the faces of the women on either side of him. They were finding him heavy. Once or twice misses. Strickland's eyes rested on him somewhat anxiously. At last she rose and shepherded the ladies out of one room. Strickland shut the door behind her, and, moving to the other end of the table, took his place between the KC and the government official. He passed round the port again and handed us cigars. The KC remarked on the excellence of the wine, and Strickland told us where he got it. We began to chat about vintages and tobacco. The KC told us of a case he was engaged in, and the colonel talked about polo. I had nothing to say and so sat silent, trying politely to show interest in the conversation. And because I thought no one was in the least concerned with me, examined Strickland at my ease. He was bigger than I expected. I do not know why I had imagined him slender and of insignificant appearance. In point of fact he was broad and heavy, with large hands and feet, and he wore his evening clothes clumsily. He gave you somewhat the idea of a coachman dressed up for the occasion. He was a man of forty, not good-looking, and yet not ugly, for his features were rather good. But they were all a little larger than life-size, and the effect was ungainly. He was clean-shaven, and his large face looked uncomfortably naked. His hair was reddish, cut very short. And his eyes were small, blue or gray. He looked commonplace. I no longer wondered that Mrs. Strickland felt a certain embarrassment about him. He was scarcely a credit to a woman who wanted to make herself a position in the world of art and letters. It was obvious that he had no social gifts, but these a man can do without. He had no eccentricity even to take him out of the common run. He was just a good, dull, honest, plain man. One would admire his excellent qualities, but avoid his company. He was null. He was probably a worthy member of society, a good husband and father, an honest broker, but there was no reason to waste one's time over him. Chapter 7 The season was drawing to its dusty end and everyone I knew was arranging to go away. 
Mrs. Strickland was taking her family to the coast of Norfolk so that the children might have the sea and her husband golf. We said goodbye to one another and arranged to meet in the autumn. But on my last day in town, coming out of the stores, I met her with her son and daughter, like myself, she had been making her final purchases before leaving London, and we were both hot and tired. I proposed that we should all go and eat ices in the park. I think Mrs. Strickland was glad to show me her children, and she accepted my invitation with alacrity. They were even more attractive than their photographs had suggested, and she was right to be proud of them. I was young enough for them not to feel shy. And they chattered merrily about one thing and another. They were extraordinarily nice, healthy young children. It was very agreeable under the trees. When in an hour they crowded into a cab to go home, I strolled idly to my club. I was perhaps a little lonely, and it was with a touch of envy that I thought of the pleasant family life of which I had had a glimpse. They seemed devoted to one another. They had little private jokes of their own which, unintelligible to the outsider, amused them enormously. Perhaps Charles Strickland was dull judged by a standard that demanded above all things verbal scintillation. But his intelligence was adequate to his surroundings, and that is a passport, not only to reasonable success, but still more to happiness. Mrs. Strickland was a charming woman, and she loved him. I pictured their lives, troubled by no untoward adventure, honest, decent, and, by reason of those two upstanding, pleasant children so obviously destined to carry on the normal traditions of their race and station, not without significance. They would grow old insensibly. They would see their son and daughter come to years of reason, marry in due course, the one a pretty girl, future mother of healthy children, the other a handsome, manly fellow. Obviously a soldier, and at last, prosperous in their dignified retirement, beloved by their descendants, after a happy, not unuseful life. In the fullness of their age, they would sink into the grave. That must be the story of innumerable couples, and the pattern of life it offers has a homely grace. It reminds you of a placid rivulet, meandering smoothly through green pastures and shaded by pleasant trees, till at last it falls into the vasty sea, but the sea is so calm, so silent, so indifferent, that you are troubled suddenly by a vague uneasiness. Perhaps it is only by a kink in my nature, strong in me even in those days, that I felt in such an existence the share of the great majority, something amiss. I recognized its social values, I saw its ordered happiness, but a fever in my blood asked for a wilder course. There seemed to me something alarming in such easy delights. In my heart was a desire to live more dangerously. I was not unprepared for jagged rocks and treacherous shoals if I could only have change, change and the excitement of the unforeseen. Chapter 8 On reading over what I have written of the Stricklands, I am conscious that they must seem shadowy. I have been able to invest them with none of those characteristics which make the persons of a book exist with a real life of their own, and, wondering if the fault is mine. I rack my brains to remember idiosyncrasies which might lend them vividness. I feel that by dwelling on some trick of speech or some queer habit, I should be able to give them a significance peculiar to themselves. 
As they stand there like the figures in an old tapestry, they do not separate themselves from the background, and at a distance seem to lose their pattern, so that you have little but a pleasing piece of color. My only excuse is that the impression they made on me was no other. There was just that shadowiness about them which you find in people whose lives are part of the social organism, so that they exist in it and by it only. They are like cells in the body. Essential, but, so long as they remain healthy, engulfed in the momentous whole. The Stricklands were an average family in the middle class. A pleasant, hospitable woman with a harmless craze for the small lions of literary society, a rather dull man, doing his duty in that state of life in which a merciful providence had placed him, too nice-looking. Healthy children. Nothing could be more ordinary. I do not know that there was anything about them to excite the attention of the curious. When I reflect on all that happened later, I ask myself if I was thick-witted not to see that there was in Charles Strickland at least something out of the common. Perhaps. I think that I have gathered in the years that intervened between then and now a fair knowledge of mankind. But even if when I first met the Stricklands I had the experience which I have now, I do not believe that I should have judged them differently. But because I have learned that man is incalculable, I should not at this time of day be so surprised by the news that reached me when in the early autumn I returned to London. I had not been back twenty-four hours before I ran across Rose Waterford in German Street. You look very gay and sprightly. I said, what's the matter with you? She smiled and her eyes shone with a malice I knew already. It meant that she had heard some scandal about one of her friends, and the instinct of the literary woman was all alert. You did meet Charles Strickland, didn't you? Not only her face, but her whole body gave a sense of alacrity. I nodded. I wondered if the poor devil had been hammered on the stock exchange or run over by an omnibus, isn't it dreadful? He's run away from his wife. Miss Waterford certainly felt that she could not do her subject justice on the curb of German Street, and so, like an artist, flung the bare fact at me and declared that she knew no details. I could not do her the injustice of supposing that so trifling a circumstance would have prevented her from giving them. But she was obstinate, I tell you I know nothing, she said, in reply to my agitated questions, and then, with an airy shrug of the shoulders. I believe that a young person in a city tea shop has left her situation. She flashed a smile at me, and, protesting an engagement with her dentist, jauntily walked on. I was more interested than distressed. In those days my experience of life at first hand was small, and it excited me to come upon an incident among people I knew of the same sort as I had read in books. I confess that time has now accustomed me to incidents of this character among my acquaintance. But I was a little shocked. Strickland was certainly forty. And I thought it disgusting that a man of his age should concern himself with affairs of the heart. With the superciliousness of extreme youth, I put thirty-five as the utmost limit at which a man might fall in love without making a fool of himself. And this news was slightly disconcerting to me personally. Because I had written from the country to Mrs. Strickland, announcing my return, and had added that unless I heard from her to the contrary, 
I would come on a certain day to drink a dish of tea with her. This was the very day, and I had received no word from Mrs. Strickland. Did she want to see me, or did she not? It was likely enough that in the agitation of the moment my note had escaped her memory. Perhaps I should be wiser not to go. On the other hand, she might wish to keep the affair quiet. And it might be highly indiscreet on my part to give any sign that this strange news had reached me. I was torn between the fear of hurting a nice woman's feelings and the fear of being in the way. I felt she must be suffering, and I did not want to see a pain which I could not help. But in my heart was a desire, that I felt a little ashamed of, to see how she was taking it. I did not know what to do. Finally it occurred to me that I would call as though nothing had happened, and send a message in by the maid asking Mrs. Strickland if it was convenient for her to see me. This would give her the opportunity to send me away. But I was overwhelmed with embarrassment when I said to the maid the phrase I had prepared. And while I waited for the answer in a dark passage I had to call up all my strength of mind not to bolt. The maid came back. Her manner suggested to my excited fancy a complete knowledge of the domestic calamity. Will you come this way, sir, she said. I followed her into the drawing room. The blinds were partly drawn to darken the room, and Mrs. Strickland was sitting with her back to the light. Her brother-in-law, Colonel McAndrew, stood in front of the fireplace warming his back at an unlit fire. To myself my entrance seemed excessively awkward. I imagined that my arrival had taken them by surprise, and Mrs. Strickland had let me come in only because she had forgotten to put me off. I fancied that the colonel resented the interruption. I wasn't quite sure if you expected me, I said. Trying to seem unconcerned, of course I did. And we'll bring the tea in a minute. Even in the darkened room, I could not help seeing that Mrs. Strickland's face was all swollen with tears. Her skin, never very good, was earthy, you remember my brother-in-law, don't you? You met at dinner, just before the holidays. We shook hands. I felt so shy that I could think of nothing to say. But Mrs. Strickland came to my rescue. She asked me what I had been doing with myself during the summer, and with this help I managed to make some conversation till tea was brought in. The colonel asked for a whiskey and soda. You'd better have one too, Amy, he said. No, I prefer tea. This was the first suggestion that anything untoward had happened. I took no notice, and did my best to engage Mrs. Strickland in talk. The colonel, still standing in front of the fireplace, uttered no word. I wondered how soon I could decently take my leave. And I asked myself why on earth Mrs. Strickland had allowed me to come. There were no flowers, and various knick-knacks, put away during the summer, had not been replaced. There was something cheerless and stiff about the room which had always seemed so friendly. It gave you an odd feeling, as though someone were lying dead on the other side of the wall. I finished tea. Will you have a cigarette? asked Mrs. Strickland. She looked about for the box but it was not to be seen, I'm afraid there are none. Suddenly she burst into tears and hurried from the room. I was startled. I suppose now that the lack of cigarettes, brought as a rule by her husband, forced him back upon her recollection. 
and the new feeling that the small comforts she was used to were missing gave her a sudden pang. She realized that the old life was gone and done with. It was impossible to keep up our social pretenses any longer. I dare say you'd like me to go, I said to the colonel, getting up. I suppose you've heard that Blygard has deserted her. He cried explosively. I hesitated, you know how people gossip, I answered. I was vaguely told that something was wrong. He's bolted. He's gone off to Paris with a woman. He's left Amy without a penny. I'm awfully sorry, I said, not knowing what else to say. The colonel gulped down his whiskey. He was a tall, lean man of fifty, with a drooping mustache and gray hair. He had pale blue eyes and a weak mouth. I remembered from my previous meeting with him that he had a foolish face and was proud of the fact that for the ten years before he left the army he had played polo three days a week. I don't suppose Mrs. Strickland wants to be bothered with me just now, I said. Will you tell her how sorry I am? If there's anything I can do, I shall be delighted to do it. He took no notice of me, I don't know what's to become of her. And then there are the children. Are they going to live on air? Seventeen years. What about seventeen years? They've been married, he snapped, I never liked him. Of course he was my brother-in-law, and I made the best of it. Did you think him a gentleman? She ought never to have married him. Is it absolutely final? There's only one thing for her to do, and that's to divorce him. That's what I was telling her when you came in. Fire in with your petition, my dear Amy, I said. You owe it to yourself, and you owe it to the children. He'd better not let me catch sight of him. I'd thrash him within an inch of his life. I could not help thinking that Colonel McAndrew might have some difficulty in doing this, since Strickland had struck me as a hefty fellow. But I did not say anything. It is always distressing when outraged morality does not possess the strength of arm to administer direct chastisement on the sinner. I was making up my mind to another attempt at going when Mrs. Strickland came back. She had dried her eyes and powdered her nose. I'm sorry I broke down, she said. I'm glad you didn't go away. She sat down. I did not at all know what to say. I felt a certain shyness at referring to matters which were no concern of mine. I did not then know the besetting sin of woman. The passion to discuss her private affairs with anyone who is willing to listen. Mrs. Strickland seemed to make an effort over herself. Are people talking about it? She asked. I was taken aback by her assumption that I knew all about her domestic misfortune. I've only just come back. The only person I've seen is Rose Waterford. Mrs. Strickland clasped her hands. Tell me exactly what she said. And when I hesitated, she insisted, I particularly want to know. You know the way people talk. She's not very reliable, is she? She said your husband had left you. Is that all? I did not choose to repeat Rose Waterford's parting reference to a girl from a tea shop. I lied, she didn't say anything about his going with anyone? No, that's all I wanted to know. I was a little puzzled, but at all events I understood that I might now take my leave. When I shook hands with Mrs. 
Strickland, I told her that if I could be of any use to her, I should be very glad. She smiled wanly, thank you so much. I don't know that anybody can do anything for me. Too shy to express my sympathy, I turned to say goodbye to the colonel. He did not take my hand, I'm just coming. If you're walking up Victoria Street, I'll come along with you. All right, I said. Come on. Chapter 9 Inch This is a terrible thing, he said, the moment we got out into the street. I realized that he had come away with me in order to discuss once more what he had been already discussing for hours with his sister-in-law. We don't know who the woman is, you know, he said. All we know is that the blackguard's gone to Paris. I thought they got on so well. So they did. Why? Just before you came in Amy said they'd never had a quarrel in the whole of their married life. You know Amy. There never was a better woman in the world. Since these confidences were thrust on me, I saw no harm in asking a few questions, but do you mean to say she suspected nothing? Nothing. He spent August with her and the children in Norfolk. He was just the same as he'd always been. We went down for two or three days, my wife and I, and I played golf with him. He came back to town in September to let his partner go away, and Amy stayed on in the country. They'd taken a house for six weeks. And at the end of her tenancy she wrote to tell him on which day she was arriving in London. He answered from Paris. He said he'd made up his mind not to live with her anymore. What explanation did he give? My dear fellow, he gave no explanation. I've seen the letter. It wasn't more than ten lines. But that's extraordinary. We happened then to cross the street and the traffic prevented us from speaking. What Colonel McAndrew had told me seemed very improbable, and I suspected that Mrs. Strickland, for reasons of her own, had concealed from him some part of the facts. It was clear that a man after seventeen years of wedlock did not leave his wife without certain occurrences which must have led her to suspect that all was not well with their married life. The colonel caught me up, of course, there was no explanation he could give except that he'd gone off with a woman. I suppose he thought she could find that out for herself. That's the sort of chap he was. What is Mrs. Strickland going to do? Well, the first thing is to get our proofs. I'm going over to Paris myself. And what about his business? That's where he's been so artful. He's been drawing in his horns for the last year. Did he tell his partner he was leaving? Not a word. Colonel McAndrew had a very sketchy knowledge of business matters, and I had none at all, so I did not quite understand under what conditions Strickland had left his affairs. I gathered that the deserted partner was very angry and threatened proceedings. It appeared that when everything was settled he would be four or five hundred pounds out of pocket. It's lucky the furniture in the flat is in Amy's name. She'll have that at all events. Did you mean it when you said she wouldn't have a bob? Of course I did. She's got two or three hundred pounds and the furniture. But how is she going to live? God knows. The affair seemed to grow more complicated, and the colonel. With his expletives and his indignation, confused rather than informed me.
I was glad that, catching sight of the clock at the Army and Navy stores. He remembered an engagement to play cards at his club, and so left me to cut across St. James Park. Chapter 10 A Day or Two Later Misses Strickland sent me round a note asking if I could go and see her that evening after dinner. I found her alone. Her black dress, simple to austerity, suggested her bereaved condition. And I was innocently astonished that notwithstanding a real emotion she was able to dress the part she had to play according to her notions of seemliness. You said that if I wanted you to do anything you wouldn't mind doing it, she remarked, it was quite true. Will you go over to Paris and see Charlie? I... I was taken aback. I reflected that I had only seen him once. I did not know what she wanted me to do, Fred is set on going. Fred was Colonel McAndrew, but I'm sure he's not the man to go. He'll only make things worse. I don't know who else to ask. Her voice trembled a little, and I felt a brute even to hesitate, but I've not spoken ten words to your husband. He doesn't know me. He'll probably just tell me to go to the devil. That wouldn't hurt you said Mrs. Strickland, smiling, what is it exactly you want me to do? She did not answer directly. I think it's rather an advantage that he doesn't know you. You see, he never really liked Fred, he thought him a fool, he didn't understand soldiers. Fred would fly into a passion. And there'd be a quarrel, and things would be worse instead of better. If you said you came on my behalf, he couldn't refuse to listen to you. I haven't known you very long, I answered. I don't see how anyone can be expected to tackle a case like this unless he knows all the details. I don't want to pry into what doesn't concern me. Why don't you go and see him yourself? You forget he isn't alone. I held my tongue. I saw myself calling on Charles Strickland and sending in my card. I saw him come into the room, holding it between finger and thumb. To what do I owe this honor? I've come to see you about your wife. Really? When you are a little older you will doubtless learn the advantage of minding your own business. If you will be so good as to turn your head slightly to the left, you will see the door. I wish you good afternoon. I foresaw that it would be difficult to make my exit with dignity. And I wish to goodness that I had not returned to London till Mrs. Strickland had composed her difficulties. I stole a glance at her. She was immersed in thought. Presently she looked up at me, sighed deeply, and smiled. It was all so unexpected, she said, we'd been married seventeen years. I never dreamed that Charlie was the sort of man to get infatuated with anyone. We always got on very well together. Of course, I had a great many interests that he didn't share. Have you found out who? I did not quite know how to express myself, who the person, who it is he's gone away with. No. No one seems to have an idea. It's so strange. Generally when a man falls in love with someone people see them about together, lunching or something, and her friends always come and tell the wife. I had no warning, nothing. His letter came like a thunderbolt. I thought he was perfectly happy. She began to cry, poor thing, and I felt very sorry for her. But in a little while she grew calmer. 
It's no good making a fool of myself, she said, drying her eyes. The only thing is to decide what is the best thing to do. She went on, talking somewhat at random, now of the recent past. Then of their first meeting and their marriage, but presently I began to form a fairly coherent picture of their lives, and it seemed to me that my surmises had not been incorrect. Mrs. Strickland was the daughter of an Indian civilian, who on his retirement had settled in the depths of the country. But it was his habit every August to take his family to Eastbourne for change of air, and it was here, when she was twenty, that she met Charles Strickland. He was twenty-three. They played together, walked on the front together, listened together to the nigger minstrels, and she had made up her mind to accept him a week before he proposed to her. They lived in London, first in Hampstead, and then, as he grew more prosperous, in town. Two children were born to them, he always seemed very fond of them. Even if he was tired of me. I wonder that he had the heart to leave them. It's all so incredible. Even now I can hardly believe it's true. At last she showed me the letter he had written. I was curious to see it, but had not ventured to ask for it. My dear Amy, I think you will find everything all right in the flat. I have given and your instructions, and dinner will be ready for you and the children when you come. I shall not be there to meet you. I have made up my mind to live apart from you, and I am going to Paris in the morning. I shall post this letter on my arrival. I shall not come back. My decision is irrevocable, yours always, Charles Strickland. Not a word of explanation or regret. Don't you think it's inhuman? It's a very strange letter under the circumstances, I replied, there's only one explanation, and that is that he's not himself. I don't know who this woman is who's got hold of him. But she's made him into another man. It's evidently been going on a long time. What makes you think that? Fred found that out. My husband said he went to the club three or four nights a week to play bridge. Fred knows one of the members and said something about Charles being a great bridge player. The man was surprised. He said he'd never even seen Charles in the card room. It's quite clear now that when I thought Charles was at his club he was with her. I was silent for a moment. Then I thought of the children. It must have been difficult to explain to Robert. I said, oh, I never said a word to either of them. You see? We only came up to town the day before they had to go back to school. I had the presence of mind to say that their father had been called away on business. It could not have been very easy to be bright and careless with that sudden secret in her heart nor to give her attention to all the things that needed doing to get her children comfortably packed off. Mrs. Strickland's voice broke again, and what is to happen to them, poor darlings? How are we going to live? She struggled for self-control, and I saw her hands clench and unclench spasmodically. It was dreadfully painful. Of course I'll go over to Paris if you think I can do any good, but you must tell me exactly what you want me to do. I want him to come back. I understood from Colonel McAndrew that you'd made up your mind to divorce him. I'll never divorce him, she answered with a sudden violence, tell him that from me. He'll never be able to marry that woman. 
I'm as obstinate as he is, and I'll never divorce him. I have to think of my children. I think she added this to explain her attitude to me. But I thought it was due to a very natural jealousy rather than to maternal solicitude. Are you in love with him still? I don't know. I want him to come back. If he'll do that we'll let bygones be bygones. After all, we've been married for 17 years. I'm a broad-minded woman. I wouldn't have minded what he did as long as I knew nothing about it. He must know that his infatuation won't last. If he'll come back now everything can be smoothed over, and no one will know anything about it. It chilled me a little that Mrs. Strickland should be concerned with gossip, for I did not know then how great a part is played in women's life by the opinion of others. It throws a shadow of insincerity over their most deeply felt emotions. It was known where Strickland was staying. His partner, in a violent letter, sent to his bank, had taunted him with hiding his whereabouts, and Strickland, in a cynical and humorous reply, had told his partner exactly where to find him. He was apparently living in an hotel. I've never heard of it, said Mrs. Strickland, but Fred knows it well. He says it's very expensive. She flushed darkly. I imagined that she saw her husband installed in a luxurious suite of rooms, dining at one smart restaurant after another. And she pictured his days spent at race meetings and his evenings at the play. It can't go on at his age, she said, after all, he's forty. I could understand it in a young man. But I think it's horrible in a man of his years, with children who are nearly grown up. His health will never stand it. Anger struggled in her breast with misery. Tell him that our home cries out for him. Everything is just the same, and yet everything is different. I can't live without him. I'd sooner kill myself. Talk to him about the past. And all we've gone through together. What am I to say to the children when they ask for him? His room is exactly as it was when he left it. It's waiting for him. We're all waiting for him. Now she told me exactly what I should say. She gave me elaborate answers to every possible observation of his. You will do everything you can for me, she said pitifully. Tell him what a state I'm in. I saw that she wished me to appeal to his sympathies by every means in my power. She was weeping freely. I was extraordinarily touched. I felt indignant at Strickland's cold cruelty and I promised to do all I could to bring him back. I agreed to go over on the next day, but one, and to stay in Paris till I had achieved something. Then, as it was growing late and we were both exhausted by so much emotion, I left her. Chapter 11 During the journey, I thought over my errand with misgiving. Now that I was free from the spectacle of Mrs. Strickland's distress, I could consider the matter more calmly. I was puzzled by the contradictions that I saw in her behavior. She was very unhappy, but to excite my sympathy she was able to make a show of her unhappiness. It was evident that she had been prepared to weep, for she had provided herself with a sufficiency of handkerchiefs, I admired her forethought. But in retrospect it made her tears perhaps less moving. I could not decide whether she desired the return of her husband because she loved him, or because she dreaded the tongue of scandal, 
and I was perturbed by the suspicion that the anguish of love contempt was alloyed in her broken heart with the pangs. Sorted to my young mind, of wounded vanity. I had not yet learnt how contradictory is human nature, I did not know how much pose there is in the sincere, how much baseness in the noble, nor how much goodness in the reprobate. But there was something of an adventure in my trip, and my spirits rose as I approached Paris. I saw myself, too, from the dramatic standpoint, and I was pleased with my role of the trusted friend bringing back the errant husband to his forgiving wife. I made up my mind to see Strickland the following evening, for I felt instinctively that the hour must be chosen with delicacy. An appeal to the emotions is little likely to be effectual before luncheon. My own thoughts were then constantly occupied with love, but I never could imagine connubial bliss till after tea. I inquired at my hotel for that in which Charles Strickland was living. It was called the Hotel des Belges. But the concierge, somewhat to my surprise, had never heard of it. I had understood from Mrs. Strickland that it was a large and sumptuous place at the back of the Rue de Rivoli. We looked it out in the directory. The only hotel of that name was in the Rue de Moines. The quarter was not fashionable, it was not even respectable. I shook my head, I'm sure that's not it, I said. The concierge shrugged his shoulders. There was no other hotel of that name in Paris. It occurred to me that Strickland had concealed his address, after all. In giving his partner the one I knew he was perhaps playing a trick on him. I do not know why I had an inkling that it would appeal to Strickland's sense of humor to bring a furious stockbroker over to Paris on a fool's errand to an ill-famed house in a mean street. Still, I thought I had better go and see. Next day about six o'clock I took a cab to the Rue de Moine, but dismissed it at the corner. Since I preferred to walk to the hotel and look at it before I went in. It was a street of small shops subservient to the needs of poor people, and about the middle of it. On the left as I walked down, was the Hotel de Belgies. My own hotel was modest enough, but it was magnificent in comparison with this. It was a tall, shabby building. That cannot have been painted for years, and it had so bedraggled an air that the houses on each side of it looked neat and clean. The dirty windows were all shut. It was not here that Charles Strickland lived in guilty splendor with the unknown charmer for whose sake he had abandoned honor and duty. I was vexed, for I felt that I had been made a fool of, and I nearly turned away without making an inquiry. I went in only to be able to tell Mrs. Strickland that I had done my best. The door was at the side of a shop. It stood open, and just within was a sign, underscore bureau, or premier, underscore I walked up narrow stairs, and on the landing found a sort of box, glassed in, within which were a desk and a couple of chairs. There was a bench outside, on which it might be presumed the night porter passed uneasy nights. There was no one about but under an electric bell was written underscore garçon, underscore I rang, and presently a waiter appeared. He was a young man with furtive eyes and a sullen look. He was in shirt sleeves and carpet slippers. I do not know why I made my inquiry as casual as possible. Does Mr. Strickland live here by any chance? I asked number 32. 
on the sixth floor. I was so surprised that for a moment I did not answer, is he in? The waiter looked at a board in the underscore bureau, underscore he hasn't left his key. Go up and you'll see. I thought it as well to put one more question, underscore. Madam Est Law? Underscore underscore Monsieur Est Sol. Underscore the waiter looked at me suspiciously as I made my way upstairs. They were dark and airless. There was a foul and musty smell. Three flights up a woman in a dressing gown, with tousled hair, opened a door and looked at me silently as I passed. At length I reached the sixth floor, and knocked at the door numbered 32. There was a sound within, and the door was partly opened. Charles Strickland stood before me. He uttered not a word. He evidently did not know me. I told him my name. I tried my best to assume an airy manner, you don't remember me. I had the pleasure of dining with you last July. Come in, he said cheerily. I'm delighted to see you. Take a pew. I entered. It was a very small room, overcrowded with furniture of the style which the French know as Louis Philippe. There was a large wooden bedstead on which was a billowing red eiderdown and there was a large wardrobe, a round table, a very small washstand, and two stuffed chairs covered with red rep. Everything was dirty and shabby. There was no sign of the abandoned luxury that Colonel McAndrew had so confidently described. Strickland threw on the floor the clothes that burdened one of the chairs, and I sat down on it, what can I do for you? he asked. In that small room he seemed even bigger than I remembered him. He wore an old Norfolk jacket, and he had not shaved for several days. When last I saw him he was spruce enough, but he looked ill at ease, now, untidy and ill-kempt, he looked perfectly at home. I did not know how he would take the remark I had prepared. I've come to see you on behalf of your wife. I was just going out to have a drink before dinner. You'd better come too. Do you like absinthe? I can drink it. Come on, then. He put on a bowler hat much in need of brushing. We might dine together. You owe me a dinner, you know. Certainly. Are you alone? I flattered myself that I had gotten that important question very naturally, oh yes. In point of fact I've not spoken to a soul for three days. My French isn't exactly brilliant. I wondered as I preceded him downstairs what had happened to the little lady in the tea shop. Had they quarreled already? or was his infatuation past? It seemed hardly likely if, as appeared, he had been taking steps for a year to make his desperate plunge. We walked to the Avenue de Clichy and sat down at one of the tables on the pavement of a large café. Chapter 12 The Avenue de Clichy was crowded at that hour and a lively fancy might see in the passers-by the personages of many assorted romance. There were clerks and shop girls, old fellows who might have stepped out of the pages of Honoré de Balzac, members, male and female, of the professions which make their profit of the frailties of mankind. There is in the streets of the poorer quarters of Paris a thronging vitality which excites the blood and prepares the soul for the unexpected. Do you know Paris well? I asked, no. We came on our honeymoon. 
I haven't been since. How on earth did you find out your hotel? It was recommended to me. I wanted something cheap. The absinthe came. And with due solemnity we dropped water over the melting sugar. I thought I'd better tell you at once why I had come to see you, I said, not without embarrassment. His eyes twinkled. I thought somebody would come along sooner or later. I've had a lot of letters from Amy. Then you know pretty well what I've got to say. I've not read them. I lit a cigarette to give myself a moment's time. I did not quite know now how to set about my mission. The eloquent phrases I had arranged, pathetic or indignant, seemed out of place on the Avenue de Clichy. Suddenly he gave a chuckle, beastly job for you this, isn't it? Oh, I don't know, I answered well, look here, you get it over. And then we'll have a jolly evening. I hesitated, has it occurred to you that your wife is frightfully unhappy? She'll get over it. I cannot describe the extraordinary callousness with which he made this reply. It disconcerted me, but I did my best not to show it. I adopted the tone used by my Uncle Henry, a clergyman. When he was asking one of his relatives for a subscription to the Additional Curate Society, you don't mind my talking to you frankly? He shook his head, smiling. Has she deserved that you should treat her like this? No, have you any complaint to make against her? None. Then, isn't it monstrous to leave her in this fashion? After seventeen years of married life, without a fault to find with her? Monstrous. I glanced at him with surprise. His cordial agreement with all I said cut the ground from under my feet. It made my position complicated, not to say ludicrous. I was prepared to be persuasive, touching, and hortatory, admonitory and expostulating, if need be vituperative even. Indignant and sarcastic, but what the devil does a mentor do when the sinner makes no bones about confessing his sin? I had no experience. Since my own practice has always been to deny everything, what then? asked Strickland. I tried to curl my lip, well, if you acknowledge that, there doesn't seem much more to be said. I don't think there is. I felt that I was not carrying out my embassy with any great skill. I was distinctly nettled, hang it all, one can't leave a woman without a bob. Why not? How is she going to live? I've supported her for seventeen years. Why shouldn't she support herself for a change? She can't. Let her try. Of course there were many things I might have answered to this. I might have spoken of the economic position of woman, of the contract, tacit and overt, which a man accepts by his marriage. And of much else but I felt that there was only one point which really signified, don't you care for her any more? Not a bit, he replied. The matter was immensely serious for all the parties concerned, but there was in the manner of his answer such a cheerful effrontery that I had to bite my lips in order not to laugh. I reminded myself that his behavior was abominable. I worked myself up into a state of moral indignation, damn it all, there are your children to think of. They've never done you any harm. They didn't ask to be brought into the world. If you chuck everything like this, they'll be thrown on the streets, they've had a good many years of comfort. 
it's much more than the majority of children have. Besides, somebody will look after them. When it comes to the point, the McAndrews will pay for their schooling. But aren't you fond of them? They're such awfully nice kids. Do you mean to say you don't want to have anything more to do with them? I liked them all right when they were kids. But now they're growing up I haven't got any particular feeling for them. It's just inhuman. I dare say. You don't seem in the least ashamed. I'm not. I tried another tack. Everyone will think you a perfect swine. Let them. Won't it mean anything to you to know that people loathe and despise you? No, his brief answer was so scornful that it made my question. Natural though it was, seem absurd. I reflected for a minute or two. I wonder if one can live quite comfortably when one's conscious of the disapproval of one's fellows. Are you sure it won't begin to worry you? Everyone has some sort of a conscience, and sooner or later it will find you out. Supposing your wife died, wouldn't you be tortured by remorse? He did not answer, and I waited for some time for him to speak. At last I had to break the silence myself, what have you to say to that? Only that you're a damned fool. At all events. You can be forced to support your wife and children, I retorted, somewhat piqued, I suppose the law has some protection to offer them. Can the law get blood out of a stone? I haven't any money. I've got about a hundred pounds. I began to be more puzzled than before. It was true that his hotel pointed to the most straightened circumstances. What are you going to do when you've spent that? Earn some. He was perfectly cool and his eyes kept that mocking smile which made all I said seem rather foolish. I paused for a little while to consider what I had better say next. But it was he who spoke first, why doesn't Amy marry again? She's comparatively young, and she's not unattractive. I can recommend her as an excellent wife. If she wants to divorce me, I don't mind giving her the necessary grounds. Now it was my turn to smile. He was very cunning. But it was evidently this that he was aiming at. He had some reason to conceal the fact that he had run away with a woman, and he was using every precaution to hide her whereabouts. I answered with decision. Your wife says that nothing you can do will ever induce her to divorce you. She's quite made up her mind. You can put any possibility of that definitely out of your head. He looked at me with an astonishment that was certainly not feigned. The smile abandoned his lips. And he spoke quite seriously, but, my dear fellow, I don't care. It doesn't matter a two-penny damn to me one way or the other. I laughed, oh, come now, you mustn't think us such fools as all that. We happen to know that you came away with a woman. He gave a little start, and then suddenly burst into a shout of laughter. He laughed so uproariously that people sitting near us looked round, and some of them began to laugh too. I don't see anything very amusing in that. Poor Amy, he grinned. Then his face grew bitterly scornful, what poor minds women have got. Love. It's always love. They think a man leaves only because he wants others. Do you think I should be such a fool as to do what I've done for a woman? Do you mean to say you didn't leave your wife 
for another woman? Of course not. On your word of honor? I don't know why I asked for that. It was very ingenuous of me, on my word of honor. Then, what in God's name have you left her for? I want to paint. I looked at him for quite a long time. I did not understand. I thought he was mad. It must be remembered that I was very young, and I looked upon him as a middle-aged man. I forgot everything but my own amazement, but you're forty. That's what made me think it was high time to begin. Have you ever painted? I rather wanted to be a painter when I was a boy. But my father made me go into business because he said there was no money in art. I began to paint a bit a year ago. For the last year I've been going to some classes at night. Was that where you went when Mrs. Strickland thought you were playing bridge at your club? That's it. Why didn't you tell her? I preferred to keep it to myself. Can you paint? Not yet. But I shall. That's why I've come over here. I couldn't get what I wanted in London. Perhaps I can hear. Do you think it's likely that a man will do any good when he starts at your age? Most men begin painting at 18. I can learn quicker than I could when I was 18. What makes you think you have any talent? He did not answer for a minute. His gaze rested on the passing throng, but I do not think he saw it. His answer was no answer, I've got to paint. Aren't you taking an awful chance? He looked at me. His eyes had something strange in them, so that I felt rather uncomfortable. How old are you? 23? It seemed to me that the question was beside the point. It was natural that I should take chances, but he was a man whose youth was past, a stockbroker with a position of respectability, a wife, and two children. A course that would have been natural for me was absurd for him. I wish to be quite fair, of course a miracle may happen, and you may be a great painter. But you must confess the chances are a million to one against it. It'll be an awful sell if at the end you have to acknowledge you've made a hash of it. I've got to paint, he repeated. Supposing you're never anything more than third-rate, do you think it will have been worth while to give up everything? After all, in any other walk in life it doesn't matter if you're not very good, you can get along quite comfortably if you're just adequate, but it's different with an artist. You blasted fool, he said. I don't see why, unless it's folly to say the obvious. I tell you I've got to paint. I can't help myself. When a man falls into the water it doesn't matter how he swims, well or badly. He's got to get out or else he'll drown. There was real passion in his voice, and in spite of myself I was impressed. I seemed to feel in him some vehement power that was struggling within him. It gave me the sensation of something very strong, overmastering, that held him, as it were, against his will. I could not understand. He seemed really to be possessed of a devil. And I felt that it might suddenly turn and rend him. Yet he looked ordinary enough. My eyes, resting on him curiously, caused him no embarrassment. I wondered what a stranger would have taken him to be, sitting there in his old Norfolk jacket and his unbrushed bowler, his trousers were baggy, his hands were not clean, 
and his face. With the red stubble of the unshaved chin, the little eyes, and the large, aggressive nose, was uncouth and coarse. His mouth was large, his lips were heavy and sensual. No. I could not have placed him, you won't go back to your wife? I said at last, never. She's willing to forget everything that's happened and start afresh. She'll never make you a single reproach. She can go to hell. You don't care if people think you an utter blackguard? You don't care if she and your children have to beg their bread? Not a damn. I was silent for a moment in order to give greater force to my next remark. I spoke as deliberately as I could, you are a most unmitigated cad. Now that you've got that off your chest, let's go and have dinner. Chapter 13 I dare say it would have been more seemly to decline this proposal. I think perhaps I should have made a show of the indignation I really felt. And I am sure that Colonel McAndrew at least would have thought well of me if I had been able to report my stout refusal to sit at the same table with a man of such character. But the fear of not being able to carry it through effectively has always made me shy of assuming the moral attitude. And in this case, the certainty that my sentiments would be lost on Strickland made it peculiarly embarrassing to utter them. Only the poet or the saint can water an asphalt pavement in the confident anticipation that lilies will reward his labor. I paid for what we had drunk. And we made our way to a cheap restaurant, crowded and gay, where we dined with pleasure. I had the appetite of youth and he of a hardened conscience. Then we went to a tavern to have coffee and liqueurs. I had said all I had to say on the subject that had brought me to Paris, and though I felt it in a manner treacherous to Mrs. Strickland not to pursue it, I could not struggle against his indifference. It requires the feminine temperament to repeat the same thing three times with unabated zest. I solaced myself by thinking that it would be useful for me to find out what I could about Strickland's state of mind. It also interested me much more. But this was not an easy thing to do. For Strickland was not a fluent talker. He seemed to express himself with difficulty, as though words were not the medium with which his mind worked. And you had to guess the intentions of his soul by hackneyed phrases, slang, and vague, unfinished gestures. But though he said nothing of any consequence, there was something in his personality which prevented him from being dull. Perhaps it was sincerity. He did not seem to care much about the Paris he was now seeing for the first time. I did not count the visit with his wife, and he accepted sights which must have been strange to him without any sense of astonishment. I have been to Paris a hundred times. And it never fails to give me a thrill of excitement. I can never walk its streets without feeling myself on the verge of adventure. Strickland remained placid. Looking back, I think now that he was blind to everything but to some disturbing vision in his soul. One rather absurd incident took place. There were a number of harlots in the tavern. Some were sitting with men others by themselves, and presently I noticed that one of these was looking at us. When she caught Strickland's eye she smiled. I do not think he saw her. In a little while she went out, but in a minute returned and, passing our table, very politely asked us to buy her something to drink. 
She sat down and I began to chat with her, but it was plain that her interest was in Strickland. I explained that he knew no more than two words of French. She tried to talk to him, partly by signs, partly in pidgin French, which, for some reason, she thought would be more comprehensible to him, and she had half a dozen phrases of English. She made me translate what she could only express in her own tongue, and eagerly asked for the meaning of his replies. He was quite good-tempered, a little amused, but his indifference was obvious. I think you've made a conquest, I laughed, I'm not flattered. In his place I should have been more embarrassed and less calm. She had laughing eyes and a most charming mouth. She was young. I wondered what she found so attractive in Strickland. She made no secret of her desires, and I was bidden to translate, she wants you to go home with her. I'm not taking any, he replied. I put his answer as pleasantly as I could. It seemed to me a little ungracious to decline an invitation of that sort, and I ascribed his refusal to lack of money, but I like him, she said, tell him it's for love. When I translated this, Strickland shrugged his shoulders impatiently, tell her to go to hell, he said. His manner made his answer quite plain and the girl threw back her head with a sudden gesture. Perhaps she reddened under her paint. She rose to her feet, underscore Monsieur ne pas poly, underscore she said. She walked out of the inn. I was slightly vexed, there wasn't any need to insult her that I can see. I said, after all, it was rather a compliment she was paying you. That sort of thing makes me sick, he said roughly. I looked at him curiously. There was a real distaste in his face. And yet it was the face of a coarse and sensual man. I suppose the girl had been attracted by a certain brutality in it. I could have got all the women I wanted in London. I didn't come here for that. Chapter 14 During the journey back to England, I thought much of Strickland. I tried to set in order what I had to tell his wife. It was unsatisfactory. And I could not imagine that she would be content with me. I was not content with myself. Strickland perplexed me. I could not understand his motives. When I had asked him what first gave him the idea of being a painter, he was unable or unwilling to tell me. I could make nothing of it. I tried to persuade myself that an obscure feeling of revolt had been gradually coming to a head in his slow mind. But to challenge this was the undoubted fact that he had never shown any impatience with the monotony of his life. If seized by an intolerable boredom. He had determined to be a painter merely to break with irksome ties. It would have been comprehensible and commonplace, but commonplace is precisely what I felt he was not. At last, because I was romantic, I devised an explanation which I acknowledged to be far-fetched, but which was the only one that in any way satisfied me. It was this. I asked myself whether there was not in his soul some deep-rooted instinct of creation, which the circumstances of his life had obscured, but which grew relentlessly. As a cancer may grow in the living tissues, till at last it took possession of his whole being and forced him irresistibly to action. The cuckoo lays its egg in the strange bird's nest. And when the young one is hatched it shoulders its foster brothers out and breaks at last the nest that has sheltered it. 
But how strange it was that the creative instinct should seize upon this dull stockbroker, to his own ruin, perhaps, and to the misfortune of such as were dependent on him. And yet no stranger than the way in which the Spirit of God has seized men, powerful and rich, pursuing them with stubborn vigilance till at last, conquered. They have abandoned the joy of the world and the love of women for the painful austerities of the cloister. Conversion may come under many shapes, and it may be brought about in many ways. With some men it needs a cataclysm, as a stone may be broken to fragments by the fury of a torrent, but with some it comes gradually as a stone may be worn away by the ceaseless fall of a drop of water. Strickland had the directness of the fanatic and the ferocity of the apostle. But to my practical mind it remained to be seen whether the passion which obsessed him would be justified of its works. When I asked him what his brother students at the night classes he had attended in London thought of his painting, he answered with a grin, they thought it a joke. Have you begun to go to a studio here? Yes. The blighter came round this morning, the master, you know, when he saw my drawing he just raised his eyebrows and walked on. Strickland chuckled. He did not seem discouraged. He was independent of the opinion of his fellows. And it was just that which had most disconcerted me in my dealings with him. When people say they do not care what others think of them, for the most part they deceive themselves. Generally they mean only that they will do as they choose. In the confidence that no one will know their vagaries. And at the utmost only that they are willing to act contrary to the opinion of the majority because they are supported by the approval of their neighbors. It is not difficult to be unconventional in the eyes of the world when your unconventionality is but the convention of your set. It affords you then an inordinate amount of self-esteem. You have the self-satisfaction of courage without the inconvenience of danger. But the desire for approbation is perhaps the most deeply seated instinct of civilized man. No one runs so hurriedly to the cover of respectability as the unconventional woman who has exposed herself to the slings and arrows of outraged propriety. I do not believe the people who tell me they do not care a row of pins for the opinion of their fellows. It is the bravado of ignorance. They mean only that they do not fear reproaches for peccadilloes which they are convinced none will discover. But here was a man who sincerely did not mind what people thought of him. And so convention had no hold on him. He was like a wrestler whose body is oiled. You could not get a grip on him. It gave him a freedom which was an outrage. I remember saying to him, look here. If everyone acted like you, the world couldn't go on. That's a damned silly thing to say. Everyone doesn't want to act like me. The great majority are perfectly content to do the ordinary thing. And once I sought to be satirical, you evidently don't believe in the maxim. Act so that every one of your actions is capable of being made into a universal rule. I never heard it before, but it's rotten nonsense. Well, it was Kant who said it. I don't care. It's rotten nonsense. Nor with such a man could you expect the appeal to conscience to be effective. You might as well ask for a reflection without a mirror. I take it that conscience is the guardian in the individual of the rules which the community has evolved for its own preservation. It is the policeman in all our hearts. 
set there to watch that we do not break its laws. It is the spy seated in the central stronghold of the ego. Man's desire for the approval of his fellows is so strong. His dread of their censure so violent that he himself has brought his enemy within his gates, and it keeps watch over him. Vigilant always in the interests of its master to crush any half-formed desire to break away from the herd. It will force him to place the good of society before his own. It is the very strong link that attaches the individual to the whole. And man, subservient to interests he has persuaded himself are greater than his own, makes himself a slave to his taskmaster. He sits him in a seat of honor. At last, like a courtier fawning on the royal stick that is laid about his shoulders. He prides himself on the sensitiveness of his conscience. Then he has no words hard enough for the man who does not recognize its sway, for, a member of society now, he realizes accurately enough that against him he is powerless. When I saw that Strickland was really indifferent to the blame his conduct must excite, I could only draw back in horror as from a monster of hardly human shape. The last words he said to me when I bade him good night were, Tell Amy it's no good coming after me. Anyhow, I shall change my hotel so she wouldn't be able to find me. My own impression is that she's well rid of you, I said, my dear fellow, I only hope you'll be able to make her see it. But women are very unintelligent. Chapter 15 When I reached London, I found waiting for me an urgent request that I should go to Mrs. Strickland's as soon after dinner as I could. I found her with Colonel McAndrew and his wife. Mrs. Strickland's sister was older than she, not unlike her, but more faded, and she had the efficient air, as though she carried the British Empire in her pocket, which the wives of senior officers acquire from the consciousness of belonging to a superior caste. Her manner was brisk, and her good breeding scarcely concealed her conviction that if you were not a soldier you might as well be a counter-jumper. She hated the guards, whom she thought conceited, and she could not trust herself to speak of their ladies, who were so remiss in calling. Her gown was dowdy and expensive. Mrs. Strickland was plainly nervous. Well, tell us your news. She said, I saw your husband. I'm afraid he's quite made up his mind not to return. I paused a little, he wants to paint. What do you mean, cried Mrs. Strickland, with the utmost astonishment. Did you never know that he was keen on that sort of thing? He must be as mad as a hatter, exclaimed the colonel. Mrs. Strickland frowned a little. She was searching among her recollections. I remember before we were married he used to potter about with a paint box. But you never saw such daubs. We used to chaff him. He had absolutely no gift for anything like that. Of course it's only an excuse, said Mrs. McAndrew. Mrs. Strickland pondered deeply for some time. It was quite clear that she could not make head or tail of my announcement. She had put some order into the drawing room by now, her housewifely instincts having got the better of her dismay, and it no longer bore that deserted look. Like a furnished house long to let, which I had noticed on my first visit after the catastrophe. But now that I had seen Strickland in Paris, it was difficult to imagine him in those surroundings. 
I thought it could hardly have failed to strike them that there was something incongruous in him, but if he wanted to be an artist, why didn't he say so? asked Mrs. Strickland at last. I should have thought I was the last person to be unsympathetic to, to aspirations of that kind. Mrs. McAndrew tightened her lips. I imagine that she had never looked with approval on her sisters leaning towards persons who cultivated the arts. She spoke of Kolcha derisively. Mrs. Strickland continued. After all, if he had any talent I should be the first to encourage it. I wouldn't have minded sacrifices. I'd much rather be married to a painter than to a stockbroker. If it weren't for the children, I wouldn't mind anything. I could be just as happy in a shabby studio in Chelsea as in this flat. My dear, I have no patience with you, cried Mrs. McAndrew. You don't mean to say you believe a word of this nonsense? But I think it's true. I put in mildly. She looked at me with good-humored contempt. A man doesn't throw up his business and leave his wife and children at the age of 40 to become a painter unless there's a woman in it. I suppose he met one of your artistic friends. And she's turned his head. A spot of color rose suddenly to Mrs. Strickland's pale cheeks. What is she like? I hesitated a little. I knew that I had a bombshell, there isn't a woman. Colonel McAndrew and his wife uttered expressions of incredulity, and Mrs. Strickland sprang to her feet, do you mean to say you never saw her? There's no one to see. He's quite alone. That's preposterous, cried Mrs. McAndrew. I knew I ought to have gone over myself, said the colonel, you can bet your boots I'd have routed her out fast enough. I wish you had gone over. I replied, somewhat tartly, you'd have seen that every one of your suppositions was wrong. He's not at a smart hotel. He's living in one tiny room in the most squalid way. If he's left his home. It's not to live a gay life. He's got hardly any money. Do you think he's done something that we don't know about, and is lying doggo on account of the police? The suggestion sent a ray of hope in all their breasts, but I would have nothing to do with it. If that were so, he would hardly have been such a fool as to give his partner his address. I retorted acidly, Anyhow, there's one thing I'm positive of, he didn't go away with anyone. He's not in love. Nothing is farther from his thoughts. There was a pause while they reflected over my words. Well, if what you say is true, said Mrs. McAndrew at last, things aren't so bad as I thought. Mrs. Strickland glanced at her, but said nothing. She was very pale now, and her fine brow was dark and lowering. I could not understand the expression of her face. Mrs. McAndrew continued, if it's just a whim, he'll get over it. Why don't you go over to him, Amy, hazarded the colonel. There's no reason why you shouldn't live with him in Paris for a year. We'll look after the children. I dare say he'd got stale. Sooner or later he'll be quite ready to come back to London, and no great harm will have been done. I wouldn't do that, said Mrs. McAndrew. I'd give him all the rope he wants. He'll come back with his tail between his legs and settle down again quite comfortably. Mrs. McAndrew looked at her sister coolly. Perhaps you weren't very wise with him sometimes. Men are queer creatures, and one has to know how to manage them. 
Mrs. McAndrew shared the common opinion of her sex that a man is always a brute to leave a woman who is attached to him, but that a woman is much to blame if he does, underscore. Lucura S.E.S. Raisons, Kayla Raison ni connaît pas, underscore Mrs. Strickland looked slowly from one to another of us, he'll never come back, she said, oh, my dear, remember what we've just heard. He's been used to comfort and to having someone to look after him. How long do you think it'll be before he gets tired of a scrubby room in a scrubby hotel? Besides, he hasn't any money. He must come back. As long as I thought he'd run away with some woman, I thought there was a chance. I don't believe that sort of thing ever answers. He'd have got sick to death of her in three months. But if he hasn't gone because he's in love, then it's finished. Oh, I think that's awfully subtle, said the colonel. Putting into the word all the contempt he felt for a quality so alien to the traditions of his calling, don't you believe it? He'll come back and, as Dorothy says, I dare say he'll be none the worse for having had a bit of a fling. But I don't want him back, she said Amy. It was anger that had seized Mrs. Strickland. And her pallor was the pallor of a cold and sudden rage. She spoke quickly now, with little gasps. I could have forgiven it if he'd fallen desperately in love with someone and gone off with her. I should have thought that natural. I shouldn't really have blamed him. I should have thought he was led away. Men are so weak, and women are so unscrupulous. But this is different. I hate him. I'll never forgive him now. Colonel McAndrew and his wife began to talk to her together. They were astonished. They told her she was mad. They could not understand. Mrs. Strickland turned desperately to me, don't underscore. You underscore C, she cried, I'm not sure. Do you mean that you could have forgiven him if he'd left you for a woman, but not if he's left you for an idea? You think you're a match for the one. You underscore C, she cried, I'm not sure. Do you mean that you could have forgiven him if he'd left you for a woman, but not if he's left you for an idea? You think you're a match for the one, but against the other you're helpless? Mrs. Strickland gave me a look in which I read no great friendliness, but did not answer. Perhaps I had struck home. She went on in a low and trembling voice, I never knew it was possible to hate anyone as much as I hate him. Do you know? I've been comforting myself by thinking that however long it lasted he'd want me at the end. I knew when he was dying he'd send for me, and I was ready to go, I'd have nursed him like a mother. And at the last I'd have told him that it didn't matter. I'd loved him always, and I forgave him everything. I have always been a little disconcerted by the passion women have for behaving beautifully at the deathbed of those they love. Sometimes it seems as if they grudge the longevity which postpones their chance of an effective scene, but now, now it's finished. I'm as indifferent to him as if he were a stranger. I should like him to die miserable, poor, and starving, without a friend. I hope he'll rot with some loathsome disease. I've done with him. I thought it as well then to say what Strickland had suggested, if you want to divorce him, he's quite willing to do whatever is necessary to make it possible. Why should I give him his freedom? I don't think he wants it. 
He merely thought it might be more convenient to you. Mrs. Strickland shrugged her shoulders impatiently. I think I was a little disappointed in her. I expected then people to be more of a piece than I do now, and I was distressed to find so much vindictiveness in so charming a creature. I did not realize how motley are the qualities that go to make up a human being. Now I am well aware that pettiness and grandeur, malice and charity, hatred and love, can find place side by side in the same human heart. I wondered if there was anything I could say that would ease the sense of bitter humiliation which at present tormented Mrs. Strickland. I thought I would try, you know, I'm not sure that your husband is quite responsible for his actions. I do not think he is himself. He seems to me to be possessed by some power which is using him for its own ends, and in whose hold he is as helpless as a fly in a spider's web. It's as though someone had cast a spell over him. I'm reminded of those strange stories one sometimes hears of another personality entering into a man and driving out the old one. The soul lives unstably in the body and is capable of mysterious transformations. In the old days, they would say Charles Strickland had a devil. Mrs. McAndrew smoothed down the lap of her gown and gold bangles fell over her wrists, all that seems to me very far-fetched, she said acidly. I don't deny that perhaps Amy took her husband a little too much for granted. If she hadn't been so busy with her own affairs, I can't believe that she wouldn't have suspected something was the matter. I don't think that Alec could have something on his mind for a year or more without my having a pretty shrewd idea of it. The colonel stared into vacancy, and I wondered whether anyone could be quite so innocent of guile as he looked, but that doesn't prevent the fact that Charles Strickland is a heartless beast. She looked at me severely. I can tell you why he left his wife from pure selfishness and nothing else whatever. That is certainly the simplest explanation, I said. But I thought it explained nothing. When? Saying I was tired, I rose to go, Mrs. Strickland made no attempt to detain me. Chapter 16 What followed showed that Mrs. Strickland was a woman of character. Whatever anguish she suffered she concealed. She saw shrewdly that the world is quickly bored by the recital of misfortune, and willingly avoids the sight of distress. Whenever she went out, and compassion for her misadventure made her friends eager to entertain her, she bore a demeanor that was perfect. She was brave, but not too obviously, cheerful but not brazenly, and she seemed more anxious to listen to the troubles of others than to discuss her own. Whenever she spoke of her husband it was with pity. Her attitude towards him at first perplexed me. One day she said to me, you know, I'm convinced you were mistaken about Charles being alone. From what I've been able to gather from certain sources that I can't tell you, I know that he didn't leave England by himself. In that case he has a positive genius for covering up his tracks. She looked away and slightly colored, what I mean is, if anyone talks to you about it, please don't contradict it if they say he eloped with somebody. Of course not. She changed the conversation as though it were a matter to which she attached no importance. I discovered presently that a peculiar story was circulating among her friends. They said that Charles Strickland had... I could not find out how this had arisen, but, 
Singularly enough, it created much sympathy for Mrs. Strickland, and at the same time gave her not a little prestige. This was not without its use in the calling which she had decided to follow. Colonel McAndrew had not exaggerated when he said she would be penniless, and it was necessary for her to earn her own living as quickly as she could. She made up her mind to profit by her acquaintance with so many writers, and without loss of time began to learn shorthand and typewriting. Her education made it likely that she would be a typist more efficient than the average, and her story made her claims appealing. Her friends promised to send her work, and took care to recommend her to all theirs. The McAndrews, who were childless and in easy circumstances, arranged to undertake the care of the children, and Mrs. Strickland had only herself to provide for. She let her flat and sold her furniture. She settled in two tiny rooms in Westminster and faced the world anew. She was so efficient that it was certain she would make a success of the adventure. Chapter 17 It was about five years after this that I decided to live in Paris for a while. I was growing stale in London. I was tired of doing much the same thing every day. My friends pursued their course with uneventfulness, they had no longer any surprises for me. And when I met them I knew pretty well what they would say, even their love affairs had a tedious banality. We were like tramcars running on their lines from terminus to terminus and it was possible to calculate within small limits the number of passengers they would carry. Life was ordered too pleasantly. I was seized with panic. I gave up my small apartment, sold my few belongings, and resolved to start afresh. I called on Mrs. Strickland before I left. I had not seen her for some time, and I noticed changes in her. It was not only that she was older, thinner, and more lined, I think her character had altered. She had made a success of her business, and now had an office in Chancery Lane. She did little typing herself, but spent her time correcting the work of the four girls she employed. She had had the idea of giving it a certain daintiness. And she made much use of blue and red inks. She bound the copy in coarse paper that looked vaguely like watered silk in various pale colors. And she had acquired a reputation for neatness and accuracy. She was making money. But she could not get over the idea that to earn her living was somewhat undignified. And she was inclined to remind you that she was a lady by birth. She could not help bringing into her conversation the names of people she knew which would satisfy you that she had not sunk in the social scale. She was a little ashamed of her courage and business capacity but delighted that she was going to dine the next night with a Casey who lived in South Kensington. She was pleased to be able to tell you that her son was at Cambridge, and it was with a little laugh that she spoke of the rush of dances to which her daughter, just out, was invited. I suppose I said a very stupid thing, is she going into your business? I asked, Oh no, I wouldn't let her do that, Mrs. Strickland answered, she's so pretty. I'm sure she'll marry well. I should have thought it would be a help to you. Several people have suggested that she should go on the stage, but of course I couldn't consent to that, I know all the chief dramatists. And I could get her a part tomorrow but I shouldn't like her to mix with all sorts of people. I was a little chilled by Mrs. Strickland's exclusiveness, 
Do you ever hear of your husband? No. I haven't heard a word. He may be dead for all I know. I may run across him in Paris. Would you like me to let you know about him? She hesitated a minute. If he's in any real want I'm prepared to help him a little. I'd send you a certain sum of money, and you could give it him gradually, as he needed it. That's very good of you, I said. But I knew it was not kindness that prompted the offer. It is not true that suffering ennobles the character, happiness does that sometimes, but suffering, for the most part, makes men petty and vindictive. Chapter 18 In point of fact, I met Strickland before I had been a fortnight in Paris. I quickly found myself a tiny apartment on the fifth floor of a house in the Rue de Dames and for a couple of hundred francs bought at a second-hand dealer's enough furniture to make it habitable. I arranged with the concierge to make my coffee in the morning and to keep the place clean. Then I went to see my friend Dirk Strove. Dirk Strove was one of those persons whom, according to your character, you cannot think of without derisive laughter or an embarrassed shrug of the shoulders. Nature had made him a buffoon. He was a painter, but a very bad one, whom I had met in Rome, and I still remembered his pictures. He had a genuine enthusiasm for the commonplace, his soul palpitating with love of art. He painted the models who hung about the stairway of Bernini in the Piazza di Spagna, undaunted by their obvious picturesqueness. And his studio was full of canvases on which were portrayed mustachoed, large-eyed peasants in peaked hats, urchins in becoming rags, and women in bright petticoats. Sometimes they lounged at the steps of a church, and sometimes dallied among cypresses against a cloudless sky. Sometimes they made love by a renaissance wellhead. And sometimes they wandered through the Campagna by the side of an ox wagon. They were carefully drawn and carefully painted. A photograph could not have been more exact. One of the painters at the Villa Medici had called him underscore Lou Maitre de la Boite a chocolates, underscore to look at his pictures you would have thought that Monet, Manet. And the rest of the Impressionists had never been, I don't pretend to be a great painter, he said, I'm not a Michelangelo, no, but I have something. I sell. I bring romance into the homes of all sorts of people. Do you know, they buy my pictures not only in Holland, but in Norway and Sweden and Denmark? It's mostly merchants who buy them. And rich tradesmen. You can't imagine what the winters are like in those countries, so long and dark and cold. They like to think that Italy is like my pictures. That's what they expect. That's what I expected Italy to be before I came here. And I think that was the vision that had remained with him always, dazzling his eyes so that he could not see the truth. And notwithstanding the brutality of fact, he continued to see with the eyes of the spirit an Italy of romantic brigands and picturesque ruins. It was an ideal that he painted. A poor one, common and shop-soiled, but still it was an ideal, and it gave his character a peculiar charm. It was because I felt this that Dirk Strove was not to me, as to others. Merely an object of ridicule. His fellow painters made no secret of their contempt for his work, but he earned a fair amount of money and they did not hesitate to make free use of his purse. 
he was generous and the needy, laughing at him because he believed so naively their stories of distress. Borrowed from him with effrontery. He was very emotional, yet his feeling, so easily aroused, had in it something absurd, so that you accepted his kindness, but felt no gratitude. To take money from him was like robbing a child, and you despised him because he was so foolish. I imagine that a pickpocket, proud of his light fingers, must feel a sort of indignation with the careless woman who leaves in a cab a vanity bag with all her jewels in it. Nature had made him a butt, but had denied him insensibility. He writhed under the jokes, practical and otherwise, which were perpetually made at his expense, and yet never ceased, it seemed willfully, to expose himself to them. He was constantly wounded, and yet his good nature was such that he could not bear malice. The viper might sting him, but he never learned by experience, and had no sooner recovered from his pain than he tenderly placed it once more in his bosom. His life was a tragedy written in the terms of knockabout farce. Because I did not laugh at him, he was grateful to me, and he used to pour into my sympathetic ear the long list of his troubles. The saddest thing about them was that they were grotesque. And the more pathetic they were, the more you wanted to laugh. But though so bad a painter, he had a very delicate feeling for art, and to go with him to picture galleries was a rare treat. His enthusiasm was sincere and his criticism acute. He was Catholic. He had not only a true appreciation of the old masters, but sympathy with the moderns. He was quick to discover talent, and his praise was generous. I think I have never known a man whose judgment was sure. And he was better educated than most painters. He was not. Like most of them, ignorant of kindred arts, and his taste for music and literature gave depth and variety to his comprehension of painting. To a young man like myself his advice and guidance were of incomparable value. When I left Rome, I corresponded with him, and about once in two months received from him long letters in queer English, which brought before me vividly his spluttering, enthusiastic, gesticulating conversation. Some time before I went to Paris he had married an Englishwoman, and was now settled in a studio in Montmartre. I had not seen him for four years and had never met his wife. Chapter 19 I had not announced my arrival to Strove, and when I rang the bell of his studio, on opening the door himself, for a moment he did not know me. Then he gave a cry of delighted surprise and drew me in. It was charming to be welcomed with so much eagerness. His wife was seated near the stove at her sewing and she rose as I came in. He introduced me, don't you remember, he said to her, I've talked to you about him often. And then to me, but why didn't you let me know you were coming? How long have you been here? How long are you going to stay? Why didn't you come an hour earlier, and we would have dined together? He bombarded me with questions. He sat me down in a chair, patting me as though I were a cushion, pressed cigars upon me, cakes, wine. He could not let me alone. He was heartbroken because he had no whiskey, wanted to make coffee for me, racked his brain for something he could possibly do for me, and beamed and laughed and in the exuberance of his delight sweated at every pore, you haven't changed, I said, smiling. As I looked at him, 
He had the same absurd appearance that I remembered. He was a fat little man, with short legs, young still. He could not have been more than thirty, but prematurely bald. His face was perfectly round, and he had a very high color, a white skin, red cheeks, and red lips. His eyes were blue and round too, he wore large gold-rimmed spectacles, and his eyebrows were so fair that you could not see them. He reminded you of those jolly, fat merchants that Rubens painted. When I told him that I meant to live in Paris for a while, and had taken an apartment, he reproached me bitterly for not having let him know. He would have found me an apartment himself, and lent me furniture. Did I really mean that I had gone to the expense of buying it, and he would have helped me to move in? He really looked upon it as unfriendly that I had not given him the opportunity of making himself useful to me. Meanwhile, Mrs. Strove sat quietly mending her stockings. Without talking, and she listened to all he said with a quiet smile on her lips, so, you see, I'm married, he said suddenly, what do you think of my wife? He beamed at her, and settled his spectacles on the bridge of his nose. The sweat made them constantly slip down, what on earth do you expect me to say to that? I laughed really, Dirk, put in Mrs. Strove, Smiling, but isn't she wonderful? I tell you, my boy, lose no time, get married as soon as ever you can. I'm the happiest man alive. Look at her sitting there. Doesn't she make a picture? Chardon, eh? I've seen all the most beautiful women in the world. I've never seen anyone more beautiful than Madame Dirk Strove. If you don't be quiet, Dirk, I shall go away. Underscore mon petit cho underscore, he said. She flushed a little, embarrassed by the passion in his tone. His letters had told me that he was very much in love with his wife, and I saw that he could hardly take his eyes off her. I could not tell if she loved him. Poor Pantaloon! He was not an object to excite love, but the smile in her eyes was affectionate. And it was possible that her reserve concealed a very deep feeling. She was not the ravishing creature that his lovesick fancy saw, but she had a grave comeliness. She was rather tall, and her gray dress, simple and quite well cut, did not hide the fact that her figure was beautiful. It was a figure that might have appealed more to the sculptor than to the costumier. Her hair, brown and abundant, was plainly done, her face was very pale, and her features were good without being distinguished. She had quiet gray eyes. She just missed being beautiful and in missing it was not even pretty. But when Strove spoke of Chardon it was not without reason, and she reminded me curiously of that pleasant housewife in her mob cap and apron whom the great painter has immortalized. I could imagine her sedately busy among her pots and pans, making a ritual of her household duties, so that they acquired a moral significance. I did not suppose that she was clever or could ever be amusing. But there was something in her grave intentness which excited my interest. Her reserve was not without mystery. I wondered why she had married Dirk Strove. Though she was English, I could not exactly place her and it was not obvious from what rank in society she sprang, what had been her upbringing, or how she had lived before her marriage. She was very silent. But when she spoke it was with a pleasant voice, 
and her manners were natural. I asked Strove if he was working, working? I'm painting better than I've ever painted before. We sat in the studio, and he waved his hand to an unfinished picture on an easel. I gave a little start. He was painting a group of Italian peasants, in the costume of the Campania. Lounging on the steps of a Roman church, is that what you're doing now? I asked, yes. I can get my models here just as well as in Rome. Don't you think it's very beautiful, said Mrs. Strove. This foolish wife of mine thinks I'm a great artist, said he. His apologetic laugh did not disguise the pleasure that he felt. His eyes lingered on his picture. It was strange that his critical sense, so accurate and unconventional when he dealt with the work of others, should be satisfied in himself with what was hackneyed and vulgar beyond belief. Show him some more of your pictures, she said, shall I? Though he had suffered so much from the ridicule of his friends, Dirk Strove, eager for praise and naively self-satisfied, could never resist displaying his work. He brought out a picture of two curly-headed Italian urchins playing marbles, aren't they sweet, said Mrs. Strove. And then he showed me more. I discovered that in Paris he had been painting just the same stale, obviously picturesque things that he had painted for years in Rome. It was all false, insincere, shoddy. And yet no one was more honest, sincere, and frank than Dirk Strove. Who could resolve the contradiction? I do not know what put it into my head to ask, I say. Have you by any chance run across a painter called Charles Strickland? You don't mean to say you know him, cried Strove a beast, said his wife. Strove laughed, underscore ma pauvre chérie. Underscore. He went over to her and kissed both her hands, she doesn't like him. How strange that you should know Strickland. I don't like bad manners, said Mrs. Strove. Dirk, laughing still, turned to me to explain, you see, I asked him to come here one day and look at my pictures. Well, he came, and I showed him everything I had. Strove hesitated a moment with embarrassment. I do not know why he had begun the story against himself. He felt an awkwardness at finishing it, he looked at, at my pictures, and he didn't say anything. I thought he was reserving his judgment till the end. And at last I said, there, that's the lot. He said, I came to ask you to lend me twenty francs. And Dirk actually gave it him. Said his wife indignantly, I was so taken aback. I didn't like to refuse. He put the money in his pocket, just nodded, said thanks, and walked out. Dirk Strove, telling the story, had such a look of blank astonishment on his round, foolish face that it was almost impossible not to laugh. I shouldn't have minded if he'd said my pictures were bad, but he said nothing. Nothing. And you underscore will underscore tell the story, Dirk, said his wife. It was lamentable that one was more amused by the ridiculous figure cut by the Dutchman than outraged by Strickland's brutal treatment of him. I hope I shall never see him again, said Mrs. Strove. Strove smiled and shrugged his shoulders. He had already recovered his good humor. The fact remains that he's a great artist, a very great artist. Strickland? I exclaimed, it can't be the same man. A big fellow with a red beard. 
Charles Strickland, an Englishman. He had no beard when I knew him, but if he has grown one it might well be red. The man I'm thinking of only began painting five years ago. That's it. He's a great artist. Impossible. Have I ever been mistaken? Dirk asked me, I tell you he has genius. I'm convinced of it. In a hundred years, if you and I are remembered at all, it will be because we knew Charles Strickland. I was astonished, and at the same time I was very much excited. I remembered suddenly my last talk with him, where can one see his work? I asked, is he having any success? Where is he living? No, he has no success. I don't think he's ever sold a picture. When you speak to men about him they only laugh. But I underscore no underscore he's a great artist. After all, they laughed at Monet. Corot never sold a picture. I don't know where he lives. But I can take you to see him. He goes to a cafe in the Avenue de Clichy at 7 o'clock every evening. If you like, we'll go there tomorrow. I'm not sure if he'll wish to see me. I think I may remind him of a time he prefers to forget. But I'll come all the same. Is there any chance of seeing any of his pictures? Not from him. He won't show you a thing. There's a little dealer I know who has two or three. But you mustn't go without me, you wouldn't understand. I must show them to you myself. Dirk, you make me impatient, said Mrs. Strove. How can you talk like that about his pictures when he treated you as he did? She turned to me, do you know? When some Dutch people came here to buy Dirk's pictures he tried to persuade them to buy Strickland's. He insisted on bringing them here to show. What did underscore you underscore think of them? I asked her. Smiling, they were awful. Ah, sweetheart, you don't understand. Well, your Dutch people were furious with you. They thought you were having a joke with them. Dirk Strove took off his spectacles and wiped them. His flushed face was shining with excitement. Why should you think that beauty, which is the most precious thing in the world, lies like a stone on the beach for the careless passerby to pick up idly? Beauty is something wonderful and strange that the artist fashions out of the chaos of the world in the torment of his soul. And when he has made it, it is not given to all to know it. To recognize it you must repeat the adventure of the artist. It is a melody that he sings to you. And to hear it again in your own heart you want knowledge and sensitiveness and imagination. Why did I always think your pictures beautiful, Dirk? I admired them the very first time I saw them. Strove's lips trembled a little, go to bed my precious. I will walk a few steps with our friend, and then I will come back. Chapter 20 Dirk Strove agreed to fetch me on the following evening and take me to the cafe at which Strickland was most likely to be found. I was interested to learn that it was the same as that at which Strickland and I had drunk absinthe when I had gone over to Paris to see him. The fact that he had never changed suggested a sluggishness of habit which seemed to me characteristic, there he is, said Strove, as we reached the café. Though it was October, the evening was warm, and the tables on the pavement were crowded. I ran my eyes over them, but did not see Strickland, look. 
over there, in the corner. He's playing chess. I noticed a man bending over a chessboard, but could see only a large felt hat and a red beard. We threaded our way among the tables till we came to him, Strickland. He looked up, hello, fatty. What do you want? I've brought an old friend to see you. Strickland gave me a glance, and evidently did not recognize me. He resumed his scrutiny of the chessboard, sit down. And don't make a noise, he said. He moved a piece and straightway became absorbed in the game. Poor Strove gave me a troubled look, but I was not disconcerted by so little. I ordered something to drink, and waited quietly till Strickland had finished. I welcomed the opportunity to examine him at my ease. I certainly should never have known him. In the first place his red beard, ragged and untrimmed, hid much of his face, and his hair was long, but the most surprising change in him was his extreme thinness. It made his great nose protrude more arrogantly, it emphasized his cheekbones, it made his eyes seem larger. There were deep hollows at his temples. His body was cadaverous. He wore the same suit that I had seen him in five years before, it was torn and stained, threadbare, and it hung upon him loosely, as though it had been made for someone else. I noticed his hands, dirty, with long nails, they were merely bone and sinew, large and strong, but I had forgotten that they were so shapely. He gave me an extraordinary impression as he sat there, his attention riveted on his game, an impression of great strength. And I could not understand why it was that his emaciation somehow made it more striking. Presently, after moving, he leaned back and gazed with a curious abstraction at his antagonist. This was a fat, bearded Frenchman. The Frenchman considered the position, then broke suddenly into jovial expletives, and with an impatient gesture, gathering up the pieces, flung them into their box. He cursed Strickland freely, then, calling for the waiter, paid for the drinks, and left. Strove drew his chair closer to the table, now I suppose we can talk. He said. Strickland's eyes rested on him, and there was in them a malicious expression. I felt sure he was seeking for some jibe, could think of none, and so was forced to silence. I've brought an old friend to see you, repeated Strove, beaming cheerfully. Strickland looked at me thoughtfully for nearly a minute. I did not speak, I've never seen him in my life, he said. I do not know why he said this, for I felt certain I had caught a gleam of recognition in his eyes. I was not so easily abashed as I had been some years earlier. I saw your wife the other day. I said, I felt sure you'd like to have the latest news of her. He gave a short laugh. His eyes twinkled, we had a jolly evening together, he said, how long ago is it? Five years. He called for another absinthe. Strove, with voluble tongue, explained how he and I had met and by what an accident we discovered that we both knew Strickland. I do not know if Strickland listened. He glanced at me once or twice reflectively, but for the most part seemed occupied with his own thoughts. And certainly without Strove's babble the conversation would have been difficult. In half an hour the Dutchman, looking at his watch, announced that he must go. He asked whether I would come too. I thought, alone, I might get something out of Strickland, 
and so answered that I would stay. When the fat man had left I said, Dirk Strove thinks you're a great artist. What the hell do you suppose I care? Will you let me see your pictures? Why should I? I might feel inclined to buy one. I might not feel inclined to sell one. Are you making a good living? I asked, smiling. He chuckled, do I look it? You look half starved. I am half starved. Then come and let's have a bit of dinner. Why do you ask me? Not out of charity, I answered coolly, I don't really care a two-penny damn if you starve or not. His eyes lit up again, come on then, he said, getting up, I'd like a decent meal. Chapter 21 I let him take me to a restaurant of his choice, but on the way I bought a paper. When we had ordered our dinner, I propped it against a bottle of St. Gomier and began to read. We ate in silence. I felt him looking at me now and again, but I took no notice. I meant to force him to conversation, is there anything in the paper, he said. As we approached the end of our silent meal, I fancied there was in his tone a slight note of exasperation. I always like to read the underscore for you tone underscore on the drama, I said. I folded the paper and put it down beside me. I've enjoyed my dinner, he remarked. I think we might have our coffee here, don't you? Yes. We lit our cigars. I smoked in silence. I noticed that now and then his eyes rested on me with a faint smile of amusement. I waited patiently, what have you been up to since I saw you last, he asked at length. I had not very much to say. It was a record of hard work and of little adventure, of experiments in this direction and in that of the gradual acquisition of the knowledge of books and of men. I took care to ask Strickland nothing about his own doings. I showed not the least interest in him. And at last I was rewarded. He began to talk of himself. But with his poor gift of expression he gave, but indications of what he had gone through and I had to fill up the gaps with my own imagination. It was tantalizing to get no more than hints into a character that interested me so much. It was like making one's way through a mutilated manuscript. I received the impression of a life which was a bitter struggle against every sort of difficulty. But I realized that much which would have seemed horrible to most people did not in the least affect him. Strickland was distinguished from most Englishmen by his perfect indifference to comfort. It did not irk him to live always in one shabby room. He had no need to be surrounded by beautiful things. I do not suppose he had ever noticed how dingy was the paper on the wall of the room in which on my first visit I found him. He did not want armchairs to sit in, he really felt more at his ease on a kitchen chair. He ate with appetite, but was indifferent to what he ate. To him it was only food that he devoured to still the pangs of hunger and when no food was to be had he seemed capable of doing without. I learned that for six months he had lived on a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk a day. He was a sensual man, and yet was indifferent to sensual things. He looked upon privation as no hardship. There was something impressive in the manner in which he lived a life wholly of the spirit. When the small sum of money which he brought with him from London came to an end he suffered from no dismay. He sold no pictures, 
I think he made little attempt to sell any. He set about finding some way to make a bit of money. He told me with grim humor of the time he had spent acting as guide to Cockneys who wanted to see the night side of life in Paris. It was an occupation that appealed to his sardonic temper and somehow or other he had acquired a wide acquaintance with the more disreputable quarters of the city. He told me of the long hours he spent walking about the Boulevard de la Madeleine on the lookout for Englishmen, preferably the worse for liquor, who desired to see things which the law forbade when in luck he was able to make a tidy sum, but the shabbiness of his clothes at last frightened the sightseers, and he could not find people adventurous enough to trust themselves to him. Then he happened on a job to translate the advertisements of patent medicines which were sent broadcast to the medical profession in England. During a strike he had been employed as a house painter, Meanwhile, he had never ceased to work at his art, but, soon tiring of the studios, entirely by himself. He had never been so poor that he could not buy canvas and paint, and really he needed nothing else. So far as I could make out, he painted with great difficulty, and in his unwillingness to accept help from anyone lost much time in finding out for himself the solution of technical problems which preceding generations had already worked out one by one. He was aiming at something, I knew not what, and perhaps he hardly knew himself, and I got again more strongly the impression of a man possessed. He did not seem quite sane. It seemed to me that he would not show his pictures because he was really not interested in them. He lived in a dream, and the reality meant nothing to him. I had the feeling that he worked on a canvas with all the force of his violent personality, oblivious of everything in his effort to get what he saw with the mind's eye, and then, having finished, not the picture perhaps, for I had an idea that he seldom brought anything to completion, but the passion that fired him, he lost all care for it. He was never satisfied with what he had done. It seemed to him of no consequence, compared with the vision that obsessed his mind, why don't you ever send your work to exhibitions? I asked. I should have thought you'd like to know what people thought about it. Would you? I cannot describe the unmeasurable contempt he put into the two words, don't you want fame? It's something that most artists haven't been indifferent to. Children. How can you care for the opinion of the crowd, when you don't care tuppence for the opinion of the individual? We're not all reasonable beings, I laughed, who makes fame? Critics, writers, stockbrokers, women. Wouldn't it give you a rather pleasing sensation to think of people you didn't know and had never seen receiving emotions, subtle and passionate, from the work of your hands? Everyone likes power. I can't imagine a more wonderful exercise of it than to move the souls of men to pity or terror. Melodrama. Why do you mind if you paint well or badly? I don't. I only want to paint what I see. I wonder if I could write on a desert island, with the certainty that no eyes but mine would ever see what I had written. Strickland did not speak for a long time, but his eyes shone strangely, as though he saw something that kindled his soul to ecstasy. Sometimes I've thought of an island lost in a boundless sea, where I could live in some hidden valley, among strange trees, in silence. There I think I could find what I want. He did not express himself quite like this. 
He used gestures instead of adjectives, and he halted. I have put into my own words what I think he wanted to say. Looking back on the last five years, do you think it was worth it? I asked. He looked at me, and I saw that he did not know what I meant. I explained. You gave up a comfortable home and a life as happy as the average. You were fairly prosperous. You seemed to have had a rotten time in Paris. If you had your time over again, would you do what you did? Rather, do you know that you haven't asked anything about your wife and children? Do you never think of them? No. I wish you weren't so damned monosyllabic. Have you never had a moment's regret for all the unhappiness you caused them? His lips broke into a smile, and he shook his head. I should have thought sometimes you couldn't help thinking of the past. I don't mean the past of seven or eight years ago, but further back still, when you first met your wife and loved her and married her. Don't you remember the joy with which you first took her in your arms? I don't think of the past. The only thing that matters is the everlasting present. I thought for a moment over this reply. It was obscure, perhaps, but I thought that I saw dimly his meaning, are you happy? I asked, yes. I was silent. I looked at him reflectively. He held my stare, and presently a sardonic twinkle lit up his eyes. I'm afraid you disapprove of me? Nonsense, I answered promptly. I don't disapprove of the boa constrictor, on the contrary. I'm interested in his mental processes. It's a purely professional interest you take in me? Purely. It's only right that you shouldn't disapprove of me. You have a despicable character. Perhaps that's why you feel at home with me, I retorted. He smiled dryly, but said nothing. I wish I knew how to describe his smile. I do not know that it was attractive, but it lit up his face. Changing the expression, which was generally somber, and gave it a look of not ill-natured malice. It was a slow smile, starting and sometimes ending in the eyes, it was very sensual. Neither cruel nor kindly, but suggested rather the inhuman glee of the satyr. It was his smile that made me ask him, haven't you been in love since you came to Paris? I haven't got time for that sort of nonsense. Life isn't long enough for love and art. Your appearance doesn't suggest the anchorite. All that business fills me with disgust. Human nature is a nuisance, isn't it? I said, why are you sniggering at me? Because I don't believe you. Then you're a damned fool. I paused, and I looked at him searchingly. What's the good of trying to humbug me? I said, I don't know what you mean. I smiled, let me tell you. I imagine that for months the matter never comes into your head. And you're able to persuade yourself that you've finished with it, for good and all. You rejoice in your freedom and you feel that at last you can call your soul your own. You seem to walk with your head among the stars. And then, all of a sudden you can't stand it anymore, and you notice that all the time your feet have been walking in the mud. And you want to roll yourself in it. And you find some woman, coarse and low and vulgar, some beastly creature in whom all the horror of sex is blatant. And you fall upon her like a wild animal. You drink till you're blind with rage. 
He stared at me without the slightest movement. I held his eyes with mine. I spoke very slowly. I'll tell you what must seem strange, that when it's over you feel so extraordinarily pure. You feel like a disembodied spirit, immaterial. And you seem to be able to touch beauty as though it were a palpable thing, and you feel an intimate communion with the breeze, and with the trees breaking into leaf, and with the iridescence of the river. You feel like God. Can you explain that to me? He kept his eyes fixed on mine till I had finished, and then he turned away. There was on his face a strange look, and I thought that so might a man look when he had died under the torture. He was silent. I knew that our conversation was ended. Chapter 22 I settled down in Paris and began to write a play. I led a very regular life, working in the morning and in the afternoon lounging about the gardens of the Luxembourg or sauntering through the streets. I spent long hours in the Louvre, the most friendly of all galleries and the most convenient for meditation, or idled on the quays, fingering second-hand books that I never meant to buy. I read a page here and there, and made acquaintance with a great many authors whom I was content to know thus desultorily. In the evenings I went to see my friends. I looked and often on the stroves, and sometimes shared their modest fare. Dirk Strove flattered himself on his skill in cooking Italian dishes, and I confess that his underscore spaghetti underscore were very much better than his pictures. It was a dinner for a king when he brought in a huge dish of it, succulent with tomatoes. And we ate it together with the good household bread and a bottle of red wine. I grew more intimate with Blanche Strove, and I think, because I was English and she knew few English people. She was glad to see me, she was pleasant and simple, but she remained always rather silent, and I knew not why, gave me the impression that she was concealing something. But I thought that was perhaps no more than a natural reserve accentuated by the verbose frankness of her husband. Dirk never concealed anything. He discussed the most intimate matters with a complete lack of self-consciousness. Sometimes he embarrassed his wife. And the only time I saw her put out of countenance was when he insisted on telling me that he had taken a purge and went into somewhat realistic details on the subject. The perfect seriousness with which he narrated his misfortunes convulsed me with laughter, and this added to Mrs. Strove's irritation. You seem to like making a fool of yourself she said. His round eyes grew rounder still, and his brow puckered in dismay as he saw that she was angry, Sweetheart, have I vexed you? I'll never take another. It was only because I was bilious. I lead a sedentary life. I don't take enough exercise. For three days I hadn't, for goodness sake, Hold your tongue, she interrupted. Tears of annoyance in her eyes. His face fell, and he pouted his lips like a scolded child. He gave me a look of appeal, so that I might put things right, but unable to control myself. I shook with helpless laughter. We went one day to the picture dealer in whose shop Strove thought he could show me at least two or three of Strickland's pictures. But when we arrived we're told that Strickland himself had taken them away. The dealer did not know why, but don't imagine to yourself that I make myself bad blood on that account. 
I took them to oblige Monsieur Strove, and I said I would sell them if I could. But really, he shrugged his shoulders, I'm interested in the young men, but underscore voyans underscore, you yourself. Monsieur Strove, you don't think there's any talent there. I give you my word of honor, there's no one painting today in whose talent I am more convinced. Take my word for it. You are missing a good affair. Someday those pictures will be worth more than all you have in your shop. Remember Monet, who could not get anyone to buy his pictures for a hundred francs. What are they worth now? True. But there were a hundred as good painters as Monet who couldn't sell their pictures at that time, and their pictures are worth nothing still. How can one tell? Is merit enough to bring success? Don't believe it, underscore do rest, underscore, it has still to be proved that this friend of yours has merit. No one claims it for him, but Monsieur Strove. And how, then? Will you recognize merit? asked Dirk, red in the face with anger. There is only one way, by success. Philistine, cried Dirk, but think of the great artists of the past, Raphael, Michelangelo, Angra, Delacroix, they were all successful. Let us go, said Strove to me, or I shall kill this man. Chapter 23 I saw Strickland not infrequently, and now, and then played chess with him. He was of uncertain temper. Sometimes he would sit silent and abstracted, taking no notice of anyone, and at others, when he was in a good humor, he would talk in his own halting way. He never said a clever thing, but he had a vein of brutal sarcasm which was not ineffective, and he always said exactly what he thought. He was indifferent to the susceptibilities of others, and when he wounded them was amused. He was constantly offending Dirk Strove so bitterly that he flung away, vowing he would never speak to him again, but there was a solid force in Strickland that attracted the fat Dutchman against his will, so that he came back, fawning like a clumsy dog. Though he knew that his only greeting would be the blow he dreaded. I do not know why Strickland put up with me. Our relations were peculiar. One day he asked me to lend him fifty francs. I wouldn't dream of it, I replied, why not? It wouldn't amuse me. I'm frightfully hard up, you know? I don't care. You don't care if I starve? Why on earth should I? I asked in my turn. He looked at me for a minute or two, pulling his untidy beard. I smiled at him, what are you amused at, he said, with a gleam of anger in his eyes, you're so simple. You recognize no obligations. No one is under any obligation to you. Wouldn't it make you uncomfortable if I went and hanged myself? because I'd been turned out of my room as I couldn't pay the rent? Not a bit. He chuckled. You're bragging. If I really did you'd be overwhelmed with remorse. Try it, and we'll see, I retorted. A smile flickered in his eyes, and he stirred his absinthe in silence. Would you like to play chess? I asked, I don't mind. We set up the pieces, and when the board was ready he considered it with a comfortable eye. There is a sense of satisfaction in looking at your men all ready for the fray, did you really think I'd lend you money? I asked, I didn't see why you shouldn't. You surprise me. Why? 
It's disappointing to find that at heart you are sentimental. I should have liked you better if you hadn't made that ingenuous appeal to my sympathies. I should have despised you if you'd been moved by it, he answered, that's better, I laughed. We began to play. We were both absorbed in the game. When it was finished I said to him, look here. If you're hard up, let me see your pictures. If there's anything I like I'll buy it. Go to hell, he answered. He got up and was about to go away. I stopped him, you haven't paid for your absinthe, I said. Smiling. He cursed me, flung down the money and left. I did not see him for several days after that, but one evening, when I was sitting in the cafe, reading a paper, he came up and sat beside me. You haven't hanged yourself after all, I remarked, no. I've got a commission. I'm painting the portrait of a retired plumber for 200 francs. Five, five, this picture. Formerly in the possession of a wealthy manufacturer at Lille, who fled from that city on the approach of the Germans, is now in the National Gallery at Stockholm. The Swede is adept at the gentle pastime of fishing in troubled waters. How did you manage that? The woman where I get my bread recommended me. He'd told her he was looking out for someone to paint him. I've got to give her 20 francs. What's he like? Splendid. He's got a great red face like a leg of mutton. And on his right cheek, there's an enormous mole with long hairs growing out of it. Strickland was in a good humor. And when Dirk Strove came up and sat down with us, he attacked him with ferocious banter. He showed a skill I should never have credited him with in finding the places where the unhappy Dutchman was most sensitive. Strickland employed not the rapier of sarcasm, but the bludgeon of invective. The attack was so unprovoked that Strove, taken unawares, was defenseless. He reminded you of a frightened sheep running aimlessly hither and thither. He was startled and amazed. At last the tears ran from his eyes. And the worst of it was that. Though you hated Strickland, and the exhibition was horrible, it was impossible not to laugh. Dirk Strove was one of those unlucky persons whose most sincere emotions are ridiculous. But after all when I look back upon that winter in Paris, my pleasantest recollection is of Dirk Strove. There was something very charming in his little household. He and his wife made a picture which the imagination gratefully dwelt upon, and the simplicity of his love for her had a deliberate grace. He remained absurd. But the sincerity of his passion excited one's sympathy. I could understand how his wife must feel for him, and I was glad that her affection was so tender. If she had any sense of humor, it must amuse her that he should place her on a pedestal and worship her with such an honest idolatry, but even while she laughed she must have been pleased and touched. He was the constant lover, and though she grew old, Losing her rounded lines and her fair comeliness, to him she would certainly never alter. To him she would always be the loveliest woman in the world. There was a pleasing grace in the orderliness of their lives. They had but the studio, a bedroom, and a tiny kitchen. Mrs. Strove did all the housework herself, and while Dirk painted bad pictures, she went marketing, cooked the luncheon, sewed, occupied herself like a busy aunt all the day. 
and in the evening sat in the studio, sewing again, while Dirk played music which I am sure was far beyond her comprehension. He played with taste, but with more feeling than was always justified, and into his music poured all his honest, sentimental, exuberant soul. Their life in its own way was an idol, and it managed to achieve a singular beauty. The absurdity that clung to everything connected with Dirk Strove gave it a curious note, like an unresolved discord but made it somehow more modern, more human. Like a rough joke thrown into a serious scene, it heightened the poignancy which all beauty has. Chapter 24 Shortly before Christmas Dirk Strove came to ask me to spend the holiday with him. He had a characteristic sentimentality about the day and wanted to pass it among his friends with suitable ceremonies. Neither of us had seen Strickland for two or three weeks. I because I had been busy with friends who were spending a little while in Paris, and strove because, having quarreled with him more violently than usual, he had made up his mind to have nothing more to do with him. Strickland was impossible, and he swore never to speak to him again but the season touched him with gentle feeling. And he hated the thought of Strickland spending Christmas Day by himself, he ascribed his own emotions to him, and could not bear that on an occasion given up to good fellowship the lonely painter should be abandoned to his own melancholy. Strove had set up a Christmas tree in his studio, and I suspected that we should both find absurd little presents hanging on its festive branches, but he was shy about seeing Strickland again. It was a little humiliating to forgive so easily insults so outrageous, and he wished me to be present at the reconciliation on which he was determined. We walked together down the Avenue de Clichy, but Strickland was not in the café. It was too cold to sit outside, and we took our places on leather benches within. It was hot and stuffy, and the air was gray with smoke. Strickland did not come, but presently we saw the French painter who occasionally played chess with him. I had formed a casual acquaintance with him, and he sat down at our table. Strove asked him if he had seen Strickland, he's ill, he said, didn't you know? Seriously? Very, I understand. Strove's face grew white. Why didn't he write and tell me? How stupid of me to quarrel with him. We must go to him at once. He can have no one to look after him. Where does he live? I have no idea, said the Frenchman. We discovered that none of us knew how to find him. Strove grew more and more distressed, he might die, and not a soul would know anything about it. It's dreadful. I can't bear the thought. We must find him at once. I tried to make Strove understand that it was absurd to hunt vaguely about Paris. We must first think of some plan, yes, but all this time he may be dying. And when we get there it may be too late to do anything. Sit still and let us think, I said impatiently. The only address I knew was the Hotel de Belgies, but Strickland had long left that and they would have no recollection of him. With that queer idea of his to keep his whereabouts secret, it was unlikely that, on leaving, he had said where he was going. Besides, it was more than five years ago. I felt pretty sure that he had not moved far. If he continued to frequent the same café as when he had stayed at the hotel, 
It was probably because it was the most convenient. Suddenly, I remembered that he had got his commission to paint a portrait through the baker from whom he bought his bread. And it struck me that there one might find his address. I called for a directory and looked out the bakers. There were five in the immediate neighborhood. And the only thing was to go to all of them. Strove accompanied me unwillingly. His own plan was to run up and down the streets that led out of the Avenue de Clichy and ask at every house if Strickland lived there. My commonplace scheme was, after all, effective. For in the second shop we asked the woman behind the counter acknowledged that she knew him. She was not certain where he lived, but it was in one of the three houses opposite. Luck favored us, and in the first we tried the concierge told us that we should find him on the top floor, it appears that he's ill, said Strove, it may be. Answered the concierge indifferently, underscore and F at underscore, I have not seen him for several days. Strove ran up the stairs ahead of me. And when I reached the top floor I found him talking to a workman in his shirt sleeves who had opened a door at which Strove had knocked. He pointed to another door. He believed that the person who lived there was a painter. He had not seen him for a week. Strove made as though he were about to knock, and then turned to me with a gesture of helplessness. I saw that he was panic-stricken, supposing he's dead? Not he, I said. I knocked. There was no answer. I tried the handle and found the door unlocked. I walked in and Strove followed me. The room was in darkness. I could only see that it was an attic with a sloping roof and a faint glimmer, no more than a less profound obscurity, came from a skylight, Strickland, I called. There was no answer. It was really rather mysterious, and it seemed to me that Strove, standing just behind, was trembling in his shoes. For a moment I hesitated to strike a light. I dimly perceived a bed in the corner, and I wondered whether the light would disclose lying on it a dead body, haven't you got a match, you fool? Strickland's voice, coming out of the darkness, harshly, made me start. Strove cried out, oh, my God, I thought you were dead. I struck a match, and looked about for a candle. I had a rapid glimpse of a tiny apartment, half room, half studio, in which was nothing but a bed, canvases with their faces to the wall, an easel, a table, and a chair. There was no carpet on the floor. There was no fireplace. On the table, crowded with paints, palette knives, and litter of all kinds, was the end of a candle. I lit it. Strickland was lying in the bed, uncomfortably because it was too small for him, and he had put all his clothes over him for warmth. It was obvious at a glance that he was in a high fever. Strove, his voice cracking with emotion, went up to him, Oh, my poor friend, what is the matter with you? I had no idea you were ill. Why didn't you let me know? You must know I'd have done anything in the world for you. Were you thinking of what I said? I didn't mean it. I was wrong. It was stupid of me to take offense. Go to hell, said Strickland, now. Be reasonable. Let me make you comfortable. Haven't you anyone to look after you? He looked round the squalid attic in dismay. He tried to arrange the bedclothes. 
Strickland. Breathing laboriously, kept an angry silence. He gave me a resentful glance. I stood quite quietly, looking at him. If you want to do something for me, you can get me some milk, he said at last. I haven't been able to get out for two days. There was an empty bottle by the side of the bed, which had contained milk, and in a piece of newspaper a few crumbs. What have you been having? I asked and nothing. For how long, cried Strove, do you mean to say you've had nothing to eat or drink for two days? It's horrible. I've had water. His eyes dwelt for a moment on a large can within reach of an outstretched arm. I'll go immediately, said Strove. Is there anything you fancy? I suggested that he should get a thermometer. And a few grapes, and some bread. Strove, glad to make himself useful, clattered down the stairs. Damned fool, muttered Strickland. I felt his pulse. It was beating quickly and feebly. I asked him one or two questions, but he would not answer, and when I pressed him he turned his face irritably to the wall. The only thing was to wait in silence. In ten minutes strove. Panting, came back. Besides what I had suggested, he brought candles, and meat juice, and a spirit lamp. He was a practical little fellow, and without delay set about making bread and milk. I took Strickland's temperature. It was a hundred and four. He was obviously very ill. Chapter 25 Presently we left him. Dirk was going home to dinner. And I proposed to find a doctor and bring him to see Strickland. But when we got down into the street, fresh after the stuffy attic, the Dutchman begged me to go immediately to his studio. He had something in mind which he would not tell me, but he insisted that it was very necessary for me to accompany him. Since I did not think a doctor could at the moment do any more than we had done, I consented. We found Blanche Strove laying the table for dinner. Dirk went up to her and took both her hands. Dear one, I want you to do something for me, he said. She looked at him with the grave cheerfulness which was one of her charms. His red face was shining with sweat. And he had a look of comic agitation, but there was in his round, surprised eyes an eager light. Strickland is very ill. He may be dying. He is alone in a filthy attic. And there is not a soul to look after him. I want you to let me bring him here. She withdrew her hands quickly. I had never seen her make so rapid a movement, and her cheeks flushed, oh no. Oh. My dear one, don't refuse. I couldn't bear to leave him where he is. I shouldn't sleep a wink for thinking of him. I have no objection to your nursing him. Her voice was cold and distant. But he'll die. Let him. Strove gave a little gasp. He wiped his face. He turned to me for support, but I did not know what to say. He's a great artist. What do I care? I hate him. Oh, my love, my precious. You don't mean that. I beseech you to let me bring him here. We can make him comfortable. Perhaps we can save him. He shall be no trouble to you. I will do everything. We'll make him up a bed in the studio. We can't let him die like a dog. It would be inhuman. Why can't he go to a hospital? A hospital. 
He needs the care of loving hands. He must be treated with infinite tact. I was surprised to see how moved she was. She went on laying the table, but her hands trembled. I have no patience with you. Do you think if you were ill he would stir a finger to help you? But what does that matter? I should have you to nurse me. It wouldn't be necessary. And besides, I'm different. I'm not of any importance. You have no more spirit than a mongrel cur. You lie down on the ground and ask people to trample on you. Strove gave a little laugh. He thought he understood the reason of his wife's attitude. Oh, my poor dear, you're thinking of that day he came here to look at my pictures. What does it matter if he didn't think them any good? It was stupid of me to show them to him. I dare say they're not very good. He looked round the studio ruefully. On the easel was a half-finished picture of a smiling Italian peasant, holding a bunch of grapes over the head of a dark-eyed girl. Even if he didn't like them, he should have been civil. He needn't have insulted you. He showed that he despised you, and you lick his hand. Oh, I hate him. Dear child, he has genius. You don't think I believe that I have it. I wish I had. But I know it when I see it, and I honor it with all my heart. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. It's a great burden to its possessors. We should be very tolerant with them. And very patient. I stood apart, somewhat embarrassed by the domestic scene, and wondered why Strove had insisted on my coming with him. I saw that his wife was on the verge of tears. But it's not only because he's a genius that I ask you to let me bring him here, it's because he's a human being, and he is ill and poor. I will never have him in my house, never. Strove turned to me. Tell her that it's a matter of life and death. It's impossible to leave him in that wretched hole. It's quite obvious that it would be much easier to nurse him here, I said. But of course it would be very inconvenient. I have an idea that someone will have to be with him day and night. My love, it's not you who would shirk a little trouble. If he comes here, I shall go, said Mrs. Strove violently, I don't recognize you. You're so good and kind. Oh, for goodness sake, let me be. You drive me to distraction. Then at last the tears came. She sank into a chair and buried her face in her hands. Her shoulders shook convulsively. In a moment Dirk was on his knees beside her, with his arms round her, kissing her. Calling her all sorts of pet names, and the facile tears ran down his own cheeks. Presently she released herself and dried her eyes, leave me alone, she said, not unkindly, and then to me. Trying to smile, what must you think of me? Strove, looking at her with perplexity, hesitated. His forehead was all puckered, and his red mouth set in a pout. He reminded me oddly of an agitated guinea pig. Then it's no, darling, he said at last. She gave a gesture of lassitude. She was exhausted, the studio is yours. Everything belongs to you. If you want to bring him here, how can I prevent you? A sudden smile flashed across his round face, then you consent? I knew you would. Oh, my precious. Suddenly she pulled herself together. 
She looked at him with haggard eyes. She clasped her hands over her heart as though its beating were intolerable. Oh, Dirk, I've never since we met asked you to do anything for me. You know there's nothing in the world that I wouldn't do for you. I beg you not to let Strickland come here. Anyone else you like. Bring a thief, a drunkard, any outcast off the streets. And I promise you I'll do everything I can for them gladly. But I beseech you not to bring Strickland here. But why? I'm frightened of him. I don't know why.